Re- repeat that again, because I wanted that on this recording, on this uh, presentation. Repeat your question again. My question had been, do we have eternal life after we've already been buried and, and breathed and everything? Do we come back as people who have turned to Yah and lived for him? Is there eternal life? Well, again, as we have talked over and over again, dealing with what is known as resurrection, um, there is a statement made in Daniel, the 12th chapter, and that statement denotes something similar to that. But the only thing about that is that has never happened upon the face of the earth. And when the angel told Daniel in the 12th chapter about those same things, uh, Daniel did not understand them, nor do I. So I confirm, I confirm what is written in Daniel. Every chapter, it's only 12 chapters, I confirm every word that is written in the book of Daniel. But far as me, but as far as me telling you today, Will we be recipients of eternal life? I cannot tell you that because I can't prove that. The words of wisdom tell us, let me find it right quick. Thank you. It is in the book of Ecclesiastics, and it allows us to know in the book of Ecclesiastics. And then after this, answering this question, we're going to get right and to the presentation, if Brother Yamin is ready. Ezekiel, I mean Ecclesiastics, <laughs> a second. Ecclesiastes, but. If I'm looking for where it tells us, one second. Mm-hmm. Shalom, family. Shalom. 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 Yeah, shalom, Elder. It's Yahaniah. Hey, Shalom, Shalom. Excuse, excuse, excuse us one second. Let me finish answering this question. And okay. the, the answer that I am giving you, sister, uh, based on what is written in Daniel 12 and what we find in Ecclesiastes, the sixth chapter, the 12th verse. Daniel said he did not understand it. Mm-hmm. And the angel told him, well, don't worry about it. You're going to go ahead and rest. But these things will happen in the end. And the things that they are talking about is what the Israelites are enduring. And you can find what the Israelites was enduring before you get to the 12th chapter. One second, please. Mm-hmm. Shalom, bro. Okay, you you on? Uh, I'm I'm speaking right now, but you on? You connected? Copy that, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, it tells us what I was saying about what uh, Daniel now was enduring and what that situation and that time denoted. You can find that out in the seventh chapter of Daniel all the way up to the 11th chapter of Daniel. It lets us know that the children of Israel was enduring some things. So it was talking about the end of their days. It was talking about the end of their days. But the, the reason why I answered you the way I did is based on Ecclesiastics, the 6th chapter, the 12th verse. And it reads, For who knows what is good for man in this life. That's talking about why he is. This says again, for who knows what is good for a man in this life? All the days of his life, of his vain life, 
which he spent as a shadow. So it's talking about um, a person actually alive on the earth. But note what it allows us to know, and this is wisdom. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? So Solomon was the wisest man that Yahweh had created. And he instilled in Solomon all this great wisdom. Well, this great man is telling the world, telling anyone that reads this, that there is no man that can tell you, as it reads, what shall be after him under the sun, meaning what shall be after you die. Mm -hmm. After you die, there is no man that can tell you mm -hmm. what shall be after you die or after after you being under the sun. So I can't tell you that. And I started it off by saying, I can't prove it. There's no man that has ever came back to life. There's no man that has been resurrected and has been put back on the earth. Nor has there been a record of a man living forever. When we look in the book of Genesis, the fourth chapter, the fifth chapter, excuse me, it allows us to know how long men was living on the earth. And we got one man almost lived to be a thousand years old. After that, their days was diminished. Today, those days have been diminished all the way to 70 to 80 years old. So, again, there is no proof, nor law, nor testimony where a person came back to life and lived forever. And please remind yourself, Yahweh said, I require that which has passed. So mm -hmm. when we look in the past, there was none that have lived forever. So your brother cannot teach you that there's going to be one that will live forever once you die and get back in the promised land. So that's why I stated it like this, sister. But I believe in every word. And if the word denotes that people will come back to life, then so be it. Mm -hmm. I just can't explain it. I can't explain it. I don't have that wisdom to tell you what will befall you once you die. Mm -hmm. I don't have that wisdom. Sister. Thank you. Great question, though. Very great question. And it's a question that constantly come up. But this question is more denoted with Christianity more than what you read in your Holy Scripture. See, this question is based on the teachings of the Christians that a character is coming back. That's where it comes from the most. Mm -hmm. And we trying to fight that and say, no, that's all of us. Well, mm -hmm. just like my brother Daniel said, he didn't understand it, nor do I. Mm -hmm. Praise you. Yeah, I said the secret things belong to him. So some things... We won't. Absolutely, absolutely. So if he do it, we all going to say hallelujah. <laughs> you, ain't in, you ain't in trouble for not knowing it. You see what I'm saying? You're not in trouble for not knowing it because you find yourself in darkness. You find yourself learning and seeking the ways of Yahweh. So you're not in trouble for not knowing it. Daniel was not in trouble because he said he did not understand it. Right. Right, right. right. Everything belongs to the Most High. Yeah, there you right. go. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. Belongs to mm -hmm. us. Yeah. There you go, brother. Mm -hmm. Brother Yamir. Yeah, His brother got me in on the line. Uh, 
Uh, it don't look like Brother Yamin is on the line right now, but I need, I have three sums to open up the presentation. Do I have uh, a volunteer or a couple of volunteers that would like to read these three sums? The Psalms is mm -hmm. Psalms 3, Psalms 27, and Psalms 62. Do we have three uh, volunteers or one volunteer that would like to read these Psalms? Psalms 3? Psalms 3, Psalms 27. You can read Psalms 3, then I'm going to need another person to read Psalms 27 and Psalms 62. 27, 62. I do Psalm 27. Good job from Chicago. Chicago. Okay. And who who wanted to do Psalms 3? I did Brother Cephas. I do Psalm 3. All right. We're going to start off with Brother Cephas with Psalms 3. And then Brother Shariah should read Psalms 27. And then we can find another volunteer to read Psalm 62, or I'll read it myself. Go ahead, Brother Cephas. You got the floor. All right. Shalom, shalom. Psalms chapter 3. Yahweh, how are they that increase and trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be with faith. Oh, my soul, there is no help for him in Yahweh. He lost. But thou, O Yahweh, art a shield for me, my glory, and my filter up my head. I cried unto Yahweh with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept. I wait, for Yahweh sustained me. I would not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Yahweh, save me, O my Elohim. For thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. Thou blessing is upon thy people. Selah. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Psalms 27, please. Hallelujah. Psalms 27. Speak, up, speak up a little louder for us where they can hear you. Yes, sir. Psalm 27. Can everybody hear? I hear. Yes, we can hear you. Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me. In this, I will be confident. The thing have I desired of Yahweh that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of Yah all the days of my life. Behold the beauty of Yahweh, and to acquire For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the place of the tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me up high upon the rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer, offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to Yahweh. Hear, O Yahweh, and I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Yahweh. I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me. O oh, Yah of my salvation, for my father and my mother forsake me. Then Yahweh will take care of me. Teach me your way, O oh, Yahweh, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen up against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of Yahweh in the land of the living. Wait on Yahweh. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on Yahweh. 
Hallelujah. Psalm 62. Is y'all men on the line yet? Do we have one more volunteer to read Psalm 62? Yes, sir. Is that y'all men? Yes. All right. Go ahead and read Psalm 62. Okay. Uh, as our beloved brother stated, we would love for everyone to turn to Psalm 52, please. You're saying 5 2, not 6 2? Yes, Psalm 62. 5, 6, 2. You said 62? 62. Yes, sir. That's the last oh, Psalm okay. that. Yeah, the last Psalm that you were supposed to read. Oh, okay, 62. Mm-hmm. We can't hear anything. Uh, is I was waiting to see if everybody's there. Okay. It reads, Truly, my soul waiteth upon Elohim. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will ye imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you, as a bowing wall shall ye be, and as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth. But they're cursed, but they curse inwardly. Selah. My soul, wait thou only upon Elohim. For my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And Elohim is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my, salv- of my strength, and my refuge. He is in Elohim. Excuse me. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. Elohim is a refuge for us, Selah. Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are all together lighter than vanity. Trust not in oppression and be and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. Elohim have spoken once, twice. I have heard this, that power belongeth unto Elohim. Also unto thee, O Yahweh, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. Hallelujah! 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 Hallelujah, 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 and shalom, Israel. Again, today's presentation will be called, See the Salvation of Yahweh. And we will use this great presentation to make another distinction between the truth and the lie between the holy and the unholy. 
We will show the holiness of this attribute, which is called salvation, and we will teach and show that it only belongs into Yahweh. We will use the volume of the book to display this great attribute, which is called salvation, and allow the listening audience to see what is found in the volume of the book dealing with Yahweh and his salvation. As I stated earlier, it's pretty funny that when you search scriptures, you don't find a lot about salvation. And the reason I say it's kind of funny is because the great blessing that Yahweh put upon Abraham, Isaac, and Israel all denotes the great salvation and mercy of their creator. So if that is true, we should find references of Yahweh's salvation throughout the volume of the book. In my study, there is over 353 references in the volume of the book dealing with Yahweh's salvation. And one should ask, why so many references? Because the covenant that Yahweh made with his children denotes this great attribute from the beginning. But we know why this great attribute is not being displayed. Just like the attribute or the term pardon, forgiveness, mercy, grace, well, those terminologies and those attributes are not being spoken out of his children's mouth on a daily because they have been confederate with other religions. They have inquired in other religions. And in inquiring, they have been snared to where they will not utter such terminologies as, as salvation, as grace, as mercy, as pardoning, as forgiveness. Instead, they have been taught, no, you're going to have to save yourself. You're going to have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And when we teach such foolishness, we are not giving Yahweh the glory. So again, we will use this presentation to make a distinction between the holy and the unholy. And this day, we will give our creator, Yahweh, the glory for such a great attribute as salvation denotes. At this time, I would like to thank the creator of the heaven and earth, Yahweh, the one that created the heaven and earth and everything therein is, by saying hallelujah. And we would also like to ask Yahweh to allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in his sight. Yahweh, our strength, and our redeemer. And that word redeemer also denotes this great attribute of salvation. Also, at this time, make sure you have in Holy Scripture a pen and a piece of paper that ye may jot down these most relevant scriptures that we will give today on this such great matter, which is, again, 
the salvation of Yahweh. I would like to start the presentation with a few words of warning by way of wisdom, and then we'll get straight into this presentation. And the two places I would love to go first is found in Proverbs, the third chapter. Proverbs, the third chapter. And let's start reading. From the very first verse to the seventh verse, and it reads, Proverbs, the third chapter, the first verse to the seventh verse, and it reads, by way of warning, my son, forget not my law, but let thy heart keep my commandments. For length of day and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Note what he stated. The Almighty wanted us, his creation, people, his chosen, to be more concerned about the living than the dead. The Almighty wanted us to understand and to give him praises for life. Well, today, they got us focusing on death. We are more worried about what will happen after we die than what is happening on earth. That's only by way of a wrong doctrine, a wrong teaching. For it tells us again in the second verse of the third chapter of Proverbs, for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. So there's a truth of the matter. And this truth of the matter, dealing with the salvation of Yahweh, it comes by way of mercy. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thy heart. So shall thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of Yahweh and man. Trust in Yahweh when we talking about this great subject matter, salvation and mercy, trust in Yahweh. No other writings, no other doctrine, not someone that uh, your brothers and sisters have set up. That is not what wisdom tells us, but wisdom tells us we that seek the salvation of Yahweh, it tells us, trust in Yahweh with all thy heart. And what is it that we are to trust? Every word that is written. It reads, and lean not into thy own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, even in dealing with death, and in dealing with how you will be saved or delivered from death. It reads, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he alone shall direct thy paths. 
Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear Yahweh and depart from evil. Also, it tells us by way of warning, I'll go one more place, and that is Proverbs, the 29th chapter. Let us all please turn our Holy Scriptures to Proverbs 29, and we will use this book as the last book of wisdom to warn us that we may hear and fear all that Yahweh has said. It tells us in Proverbs, the 29th chapter, and let's pick up at the very first verse. And it reads, He that brings often reproved, he that being often reproved, corrected, hardens his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. So you will never be able to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. And today we are mourning. Today many people are not talking about Yahweh coming to save us. Today, many people are not talking about and hoping in that Yahweh do to us as he did for our fathers when he brought them up out of Egypt and up out of Babylon. And he brought them out of Egypt and Babylon by way of salvation. They were saved. They were forgiven. They was pardoned. They was made clean. And they were given the statues of life to live therein. But we don't pray for that. We don't hope for that. We pray and hope that the things we do in darkness will deliver us. Thus, it continued to tell us, in Proverbs, the 29th chapter, whoso love wisdom rejoices his father, but he that keep company with harlot spends his substance. The king, by judgment, established the land, but he that received gifts overthrow it. A man that flatters his neighbor, that give him an easy way out, that will be a respectable person and answer you according to what you're looking for, it reads, a man that flatter his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. In the transgression of an evil man, there is a snare. But the righteous does sing and rejoice. And today's song is the salvation of Yahweh. It continues to read, the righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked regards not to know it. They don't care about your financial situation. They don't care if you employed or not. As long as you bring in that tie, they don't care what state you find yourself in. It reads, scornful men bring a city into a snare, but wise men turn away wrath. If a wise man contend with a foolish man, and we all are witnesses of these things, whether he rage or laugh, there is no rest. 
The bloodthirsty hate the upright, but the just seek his soul. A fool utters all his mind, but a wise man keeps it in till afterwards. If a ruler hearken to lies, and many of these brothers have called themselves rulers. They have called themselves elders. They have called themselves marais, and they have taught you lies. Well, look what the Creator called you. It reads, if a ruler hearken to lies, all of you, his servants, are wicked. Why? Because you have been taught a lie and you are living therein. The poor and the deceitful man meet together. Yahweh lightens both their eyes. There's only one truth. I don't care what side of the coin you own. When he lightens your eyes, there's going to only be one truth. The king that faithfully judge the people, his throne shall be established forever. Well, we don't have to worry about that today because our brothers that lean upon their own understanding will readily tell you we are not under the judgments today. And that's probably why you won't ever find a king because to be a king, of Yahweh, you must be under the covenant of the law. And as you just read in the 14th verse, that king must speak judgment faithfully, for his throne shall be established forever. The rod and reproof gives wisdom. But a child left to himself bring his mother to shame. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increases, but the righteous shall see their fall. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight. To thy soul. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keeps the law, happy is he. A servant will not be corrected by words, for though he understand, he will not answer. See, thy a man that is hasty in his words. There is more hope of a fool than of him. He that delicately brings up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at length. An angry man stirs up strife. And a furious man abounds in transgression. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Whoso is partner with a thief, hate his own soul. And many of you have been partners with a thief when you help your moray, your preacher, your teacher, to solicitize, you became a partner with a thief. And the scriptures tells us, hated his own soul. He hear cursing, and be we it not. The fear of man brings a snare. And many of us, Fear our teachers to where we will take heed to his word over the word that is written. 
Thus, wisdom allows us to know we are truly snared, as it told us, when a ruler hearkened to a lie, all his servants are wicked. Thus, again, it reads in the 25th verse, the fear of man brings a snare. But whoso put his trust in Yahweh, especially dealing with this subject matter, the salvation of Yahweh, it tells us, shall be safe. Many seek the ruler's favor, and we see that today. We are telling our brothers and sisters that we're not under the covenant of the law. We are telling our brothers and sisters that we're not under the statutes that is under the covenant of the law, like the Sabbath day. But they refuse to fear Yahweh and depart from evil because they seek the ruler's favor. They seek the moray's favor. They seek the teacher and preacher favor. But every man's judgment comes from Yahweh. So you need to fear Yahweh, not man, because we just found out fearing man will bring a snare. In the last verse, which is the 27th verse of Proverbs 29, it reads, An unjust man is an abomination to the just. And he that is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. For the Almighty have made a distinction between the holy and the unholy throughout the volume of the book. And saying that, let us establish this great subject matter, which is called the salvation of Yahweh. And I would like to do so by having us all turn our holy scriptures to Exodus the 34th chapter, because I want to give Yahweh praise. I want to extol his holy name with these words and then break down these words to allow us to understand the salvation of Yahweh. So let us all please turn our scriptures to the book of Exodus, the 34th chapter. And it tells us in Exodus, the 34th chapter, if we all turn there, please. And let's pick up at the very first verse. Usually I try to do it, our presentations, in chronological order. But I need to kick in the door with Exodus, 34th first. Exodus. The 34th chapter, please. For it tells us in Exodus, the 34th chapter, something very special that I don't think many people on the face of the earth even know about. But us, calling ourselves the sons and daughters of the creator of the heaven and earth, we are to know these things. We are to declare these things. We are his witnesses that post to proclaim to the world that Yahweh is the only Savior, which is another term that denotes this great subject matter and this great attribute that belongs only to Yahweh, and that is salvation. Thus, it tells us in Exodus, the 34th chapter, if we pick up at the first verse, and I would love to read the first nine verses. Exodus, the 34th chapter, the first to the ninth verse, and it reads, 
And Yahweh said unto Moses, Heave thee two tablets of stone, like unto the first. And I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thy breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning into Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount. Neither let the flock nor herds feed before that mount. And he heaved two tables of stone, like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up into Mount Sinai, as Yahweh had commanded him, and took in his hand two tables of stone. And Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed, as we will proclaim this day, the name of Yahweh. And Yahweh passed by before him and proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, note, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, as your brother have taught over and over again, and transgression in sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty because he's not a respecter person, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children and to the third and to the fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. We all would if we just heard those great words and heard those great attributes that only belongs to Yahweh. It tells us in the ninth and last verse that I will read of this chapter, and he said, if now I have found grace, and we got the audacity to not want to use the word grace because we find that the people in another doctrine, in the so-called New Testament, uses this great attribute of our creator, so we don't want to use it. But it allows us to know here, way before any character in a New Testament was ever imagined, the children of Israel, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob understood and was told as it reads in this ninth verse. And he said, if now I have found grace in thy sight, Yahweh, let my master, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people. And look at the other attribute that denotes salvation. It reads, and pardon Forgive our iniquity and our sin and take us for thy inheritance. Did y'all get that? It allows us to know to be a recipient of the salvation of Yahweh, you must be forgiven. 
You must be pardoned. You must be cleaned. Thus, let us turn our scriptures to the beginning. Let us turn our scriptures to Genesis, the 12th chapter, and let's get a great understanding of this great attribute of Yahweh, which is called salvation, and let's find in the beginning where these things come from and why we are to hope in them this day. Genesis, the 12th chapter, please. A lot of people ask, well, brother, what should we do today? And I know they get tired of me giving the same correct answer. I tell them to fear Yahweh and to depart from evil and wait on your Savior. As our brother Cephas read in Psalms 3, our brother Shariah read in Psalms 27, and our brother Yamin read in Psalms 62. We got to wait on Yahweh. We supposed to fear Yahweh and depart from evil and hope in all that he has said. And when we read and understand all that he has said, he has allowed his children to know all is not lost. Because I'm going to come and save you out of this. This is not the first time your people find themselves in captivity. But if you know the history of your people and of your creator, you know that your people was saved out of those situations each and every time. And that's what this word salvation denotes, being saved being shown the mighty acts and the strength and the marvels of your creator. Genesis, the 12th chapter, tells us if we read let's pick up at the second verse. And it tells us in the second and third verse of Genesis, the 12th chapter, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless. Don't forget what we read in Exodus, the 34th chapter. It tells us, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thy shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and no, and curse him that curse thee. Well, when this curse is upon us, for us to become the blessed again, we must be saved. It must come by way of Yahweh's salvation. And the Almighty let Abraham, our father, to know these things in the beginning. It says, again in the third verse, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Well, before all the families of the earth be blessed, guess what? When Israel is cursed, Yahweh must curse them that curse thee. And then you will be a recipient of salvation. And we're going to show these things. For we truly have light on the matter. Thus, Using the volume of the book, we can show the law and the testimony on these great things. It also tells us 
in Genesis, the beginning, if we take a look at the 15th chapter of Genesis. And let's take a look at the 13th and 14th verse. And it reads in Genesis, the 15th chapter, the 13th and 14th verse, it reads. And he said unto Abram, No of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them, not serve Yahweh in them, but serve them. And they shall afflict them 400 years. Don't forget what you just read in Genesis 12. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. Another testimony, another chapter and verse to establish this great salvation in the beginning. It also tells us, before we leave the book of Genesis, which denote the beginning, and I use this to allow us to know that this salvation came only by way of the covenant that Yahweh made with his chosen. We just read what he said to his chosen in Genesis 12. We just read what he said to his chosen in Genesis 15, dealing with his seed. Well, before I leave Genesis, let's take a look at Genesis 49. Genesis only has 50 chapters. So before I go into the law to show that we have light on this matter, I want us to see that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his seed knew of the salvation of Yahweh so much that they would always hope in it. As I stated earlier, we should be hoping in the same thing. We are taught to fear Yahweh and to depart from evil and to wait on our Savior. And we are to hope in all that he, are, that he has said. We are not to be the dry bones that have lost their hope. We are to hope in these words of salvation, especially when we find ourselves cursed and in hell. Thus, it tells us in Genesis, the 49th chapter, If we take a look at the 18th verse, Genesis, the 49th chapter, the 18th verse tells us, dealing with the blessings that that Jacob put upon his 12 sons, well, when it got to the son named Dan, it tells us, if we read the 16th to the 18th verse, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels, so that his rider shall fall backwards. The 18th verse, I have waited for thy salvation, Yahweh. So even in the days that Jacob blessed his 12 sons, 
They understood. They had knowledge of the great salvation of Yahweh, and they had knowledge that the covenant that is made with them denotes this great attribute of Yahweh, which only denotes him alone being thy Savior. No one else in the world could save you. Well, let's continue proving these things before I go to the law in the book of Exodus to show the testimonies of these things and what the Israelites were saved out of. That way we can compare and parallel ourselves with what we're reading. We can find today that, hey, we are in the same situation. Why wouldn't Yahweh be the one to save us out of this like he saved our fathers out of what we're about to read? But before we go there, I want to say a song to rejoice in this great salvation. And that song is found in Isaiah, the 25th chapter. Let's go to Isaiah 25, and then we'll kick in the door with Exodus chapter 1. But before we show the testimonies, of what the Israelites were saved out of. Let's go to Isaiah, the 25th chapter. For as I stated in the beginning, we will use the volume of the book. Isaiah, the 25th chapter. And it tells us in Isaiah 25, in this great psalm of praise, if we pick up at the very first verse, and it reads to the ninth verse, O Yahweh, thy art, my Elohim, I will exalt thee. And note what he's exalting him for, what the praise is, is for. I will praise thy name, for thy has done wonderful things. And that's what it was called when he showed the salvation to our fathers, the Israelites that were in Egypt. It tells us wonderful things, thy counsels of old are Faithfulness and truth, for Yahweh changes not. For thy has made of a city in heat, of a defense city a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. And that's what happens when Yahweh curse them that have cursed thee. That's what happens when Yahweh saved his children. It reads, Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of the terrible nations shall fear thee. For thy has been a strength to the poor, and that denotes salvation. A strength to the needy in his distress, because we need to be saved up out of it. A refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat. When the blast of the terrible one is as a storm against the wall. Thy shall bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud. The branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low, and in this mountain 
shall Yahweh of hosts make into all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the leaves, of fat things full of marl, of wine on the leaves, well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering. Cast over all people. Please take note. And the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death. This is what salvation denotes. And victory. And Yahweh Elohim will wipe away tears from all, all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from all, all the earth. That is salvation. For Yahweh has spoken it. And the last verse I will read is the ninth verse. Thus it reads. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our Elohim. Note, we have waited those that fear him, that depart from evil, that trust in him. It reads, we have waited for him, and he alone will save us. This is Yahweh, not Yahweh and a son, not Jesus, not Muhammad, not I, none of those. It tells us in singular, this is Yahweh. We, the children of Israel, and any other man that Yahweh have created, we have waited for him, we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Well, what is this great salvation that Isaiah is praising Yahweh about? Let us turn our scriptures to Exodus, the first chapter. And please mind yourself. This is not you in Exodus, but it is a similitude of you in America. And it allows us to have the same hope that our fathers had, that we one day will see the salvation of Yahweh. Exodus, the first chapter, please. For this is the only way that you can teach it, because the story has already been told. As I love to say, we just played our part in a play without a script. Many of us don't have the script. We don't know why we play the parts that we play. But you can rest assured, the story has already been told. Later on, in retrospect, you find yourself in captivity. So what would a wise man do? Will he not seek his creator to find out how do he be delivered? How do he get himself out of hell? Absolutely. And it is called hope. And we are to hope in these words, even today. Exodus, the first chapter, please. Salvation. How did the Israelites see salvation? Did salvation have anything to do with them being cursed and they being delivered? From a curse? Absolutely. Thus, it tells us in Exodus, it's going to allow us to know the curse. And 
And before I establish the curse, we want to have this on recording. It allows us to know that the word salvation spoken in the so-called Hebrew that we have today is called Yeshua. Did y'all hear that? It is called Yahshua. It is spelled Y-E-S-H-U-A-H. And many people attribute this great word to another character in the so-called New Testament. Well, today we see that this name denotes the term salvation. And with this word, there are doctrines teaching that a character that has been named after the word salvation will save you and I. And that is very misleading because it takes away from the great attribute of Yahweh. And some other character is getting the praise of the things that Yahweh can only do. Those that forgot the story, and I'm just saying it that way, we know that the the, the character in the new text that was called after his name, salvation, couldn't save himself. So we know that that name does not denote the character nor the attribute of our creator. So it allows us to know Yahshua, our salvation, means to help. It means deliverance. It means salvation. It means victory. It means welfare. It also, it is sometimes, it is sometimes, some, excuse me, it is something saved or delivered. So it allows us to know, and it also tells us, in the abstract sense, it is something saved or delivered. If one finds himself in that condition, he is in good health and enjoys prosperity. So because salvation has came. So I just wanted us to have an idea of what this salvation denotes. And when you try to compare it with the character of the New Testament, just because his name might represent the, or might be the same word for salvation in Hebrew, it does not mean that he is a savior, nor does it mean that he has any of the attributes of salvation? As I stated, based on the rumor, he couldn't save himself. Well, we know Yahweh is the creator of all, even salvation. Exodus, the first chapter, let's pick up at the eighth verse and let's get the reading. For it tells us in Exodus 1, the 8th verse, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt. And just to parallel the story, based on the current event, 
United States is about to have a new king or queen. It says here, now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there fall out any war, they join also into our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up, please take note, out of the land. Therefore did they set over them taskmasters, as they have done to us, to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pepton and Ramses. And this is so true. Uh, one of our dear sisters put a post up the other day talking about uh, how long we have to work for the white man, uh, dealing with retirement and Social Security. Uh, they got it now that you can't retire until 65 years old. Well, our wise sister brought up, well, the life expectancy for us is only 70 years. So that's just like working us to death because they work you and not allow you to retire until the age 65. Well, the Almighty, most of us, is only allowing us to live for 70 years. So you have actually worked it yourself to death. Thus it reads again. In the 11th verse, therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burden. And they built for, rent, for, for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithon and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, note the salvation. Note what you will be saved from. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Sound familiar? And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, working them to death in mortar, in brick, and in all manners of service in the field. All their service, I don't care what job you got wherein they made them serve was with rigor. And I need you to serve me till you die, just about. Because many of us don't make it to 70, to make it to 65. Many of us die before 65. So in so many words, they telling us they need us to work to death, you're only here to serve us. It also tells us, if we take a look at the second chapter, the second chapter of Exodus. And let's pick up at the 23rd verse, the second chapter of Exodus. And it reads in the 23rd verse to the 25th verse of second Exodus. 
And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died. And the children of Israel sighed by reason of bondage. And you should be sighing, especially knowing that their intention is to work you to death. But you can rest assured, many of us, some of us, Whoever the remnant is will be saved out of it. So, yeah, today we can look at it like, yeah, well, this is what we need to do, this, that, and another, because of the situation you find yourself in. But the Almighty promises to save you out of your troubles. This trouble, working one to death, is truly trouble. You not able to retire for 65 years is truly trouble. Thus it reads, again in the 23rd verse, and it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up into Elohim. Don't forget what Yahweh promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in their seed. It reads, and their cry came up into Yahweh by the reason of bondage. And Yahweh heard their groaning. And Yahweh remembered his covenant. I told you. Salvation has everything to do with this great covenant. With Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. The last verse reads, And Yahweh looked upon the children of Israel as he looked upon us, as he hear our cry. And Yahweh had respect into them. Well, let's see what this respect denotes. It tells us in the third chapter of Exodus. And let's pick up at the seventh verse. Because we need to see what this salvation truly denotes. We need to see and understand what did the Israelites in Egypt get saved from? Was they just in a man land? Or was they being cursed? Was they being oppressed? Did they find themselves under many troubles? Was their sons being executed every day in the streets? What was it that they needed to be saved from? Why did Yahweh tell the children of Israel to stand still and watch the salvation of Yahweh? Let's read. It tells us in Exodus, the third chapter, the seventh verse, and Yahweh said, I have surely seen the affliction. Are we not afflicted today? Are we not seeing our sons and daughters destroyed each and every day? Are we not working ourselves to death and still not having enough? It reads, And Yahweh said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry. Maybe not their prayers, but I have definitely heard their cry. And this cry only coming by way of affliction, oppression, and mental illness. It reads, one more time in the seventh verse, 
And Yahweh said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know your sorrow. It says their sorrow. And I have come down to deliver another great word that reference salvation. Them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land based on the covenant and to a good land and a large and to a land flowing with milk and honey and to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perzites and the Havites and the Jubasites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. You will not be saved because you acting like you keeping the law in these feast days. But you will be saved when you are afflicted and your cry is heard by your creator. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee into Pharaoh, that thy mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. It also tells us in this great chapter, if we take a look at the 16th verse, and let's read to the 18th verse, and it reads in Exodus 3, go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, Yahweh, Elohim of your fathers the Elohim of Abraham, of Ishkak, and of Yaakov, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And what is being done? They are forced to work themselves to death. They find a self serving the enemy. And in their servitude, it is done rigorously, hard, unfair, unjust. It continues to tell us, and I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt and to the land of the Canaanites and to the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perzites, the Havites, the Jubasites, and to a land flowing with milk and honey. And the last verse I will read out of this chapter is the 18th verse, and it reads, And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thy shall come, Thy and the elders of Israel, and to the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, Yahweh, Elohim of the Hebrews, have met with us, and now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, out of their land, that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our Elohim. That was not the only thing stated in this time before the children of Israel was witnesses of his salvation. Thus, let us turn to the sixth chapter of Exodus. The sixth chapter of Exodus. And let's read the first 13 verses. And it reads, Then Yahweh said unto Moses, Now shall thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand 
shall he let them go. And with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And Elohim speak unto Moses and said unto him, I am Yahweh. And I appeared unto Abraham, and to Isaac, and to Jacob by the name of Elohim Almighty. But my name, Yahweh, was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them. Note how the covenant keep popping up before we see the salvation. To give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, which we showed in Genesis, the 15th chapter. If we continue to read the 18th to the 21st verse, we will sing these words. Wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel. That's why they need to be saved. Whom the Egyptians keep in bondage as you are kept this day. And I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am Yahweh. And I will bring you out from under the burden, the hard labor, the unfairness of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage. And I will what? Redeem you. Another great terminology that denotes salvation. It reads, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm, and with great judgment. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a Elohim. No, when you become the sons and daughters of Yahweh, it is only when Yahweh show forth his salvation by taking you from the enemy. And when he take you from the enemy, you become his sons and daughters. And note, and I will be to you a Elohim. And once I say, once I save you, once I show you the salvation, it reads, and ye shall know that I am Yahweh. And that's a great point because salvation has not been shown. And who do we, who do the people think denote salvation today? They say it's some character. They say it's some guy that done died. If the, if the rumor is correct. So today, before you are saved, if you don't have wisdom, you don't even know that Yahweh is the Savior. You don't even know Yahweh is the only one that can save you. You going around teaching about a dead man saving you that couldn't even save himself. And our fathers in Egypt probably had the same situation. That's why we're reading this. And we paralleling it and making a similitude among ourselves. So before you are saved, you might not have the wisdom to know that Yahweh is the only one that can save us. You might not have the wisdom and knowledge of the holy that we are supposed to be waiting on Yahweh to save us. Thus it tells us in the eighth verse, and I will bring you in into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it you for inheritance, which denote all of the Israelites' dwellings. And he established it by saying, I am Yahweh. 
the ninth verse read, and Moses speak so unto the children of Israel. And I'm speaking these same words to us. But note the similarity. It reads, but they hearken not unto Moses. They refuse to believe that Yahweh is the only Savior. They'd rather talk about a Messiah. They'd rather talk about a character in the New Testament. They'd rather talk about themselves pulling themselves up by the bootstraps instead of acknowledging that there is only one Savior. And he's going to say according to his will. Thus it tells us in the ninth verse, and Moses spoke so unto the children of Israel, but they hearken not unto Moses. Why not? Because they find themselves in hell. Because they find themselves being worked to death. Because they find themselves being afflicted. Because they find themselves oppressed. Because they find themselves being killed uh, like wild bulls in a net on every corner. Because they find themselves diseased with mental illness and all that. And we say, well, where, where is all that read at, brother? Let's keep reading. It says, and Moses spoke so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit. Our spirit is so out of whack with the Almighty, that there is a disease that goes around, that they, that, that they call, that goes around, it is called mental illness. We are killing ourselves. We are committing suicide. We are doing all these things based on a anguish, a shortness, or a strikeness of spirit. And not just that, these, this mental illness is coming by way of what we read in Exodus 1, this rigorous servitude, this hard bondage, this unfairness. It reads, and for cruel bondage. So surely these people need to be saved. Surely these people hoping in salvation. It continued to read, and Yahweh speaking to Moses saying, Go and speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses speak before Yahweh saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then would Pharaoh hear me, who am of uncircumcised lips? And Yahweh speak unto Moses and unto Aaron, and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring, it reads, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. It also tells us, if we take a look at the 13th chapter of Exodus, and let's pick up at the 17th verse. And as we go to the 17th verse, we're going to read to the 22nd verse and kick straight in to the 14th chapter. Because we have worked our way. I haven't showed every incident that the children of Israel have endured, nor have I spoke about every incident that we endure. But I gave us a gateway of what... Uh, this salvation will denote. It denotes Yahweh saving his people out of 
a conflict, out of affliction, out of oppression, out of rigorous servitude, out of being worked to death. Thus it tells us in the 17th verse of the 13th chapter of Exodus. And it came to pass, for there is a time for everything in a season, for everything under the sun. Thus we read, and it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that Elohim led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For Yahweh said, least. Preventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But Yahweh led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up hornets out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had strictly sworn the children of Israel saying, Yahweh will surely visit you. Another great word that denotes salvation. And ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And they took their journey from Shekot and encamped in at them in the edge of the wilderness. And Yahweh went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the puller of fire by night from before the people. The 14th chapter, the first verse, and Yahweh speak unto Moses, say, speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihiroth, between Magdal and the sea, over against Bow Zephon, before it shall before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will hearten Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am Yahweh, and they did so. Well, not only would the Egyptians know, but the children of Israel shall know. Because they didn't know just like we don't know today. Many of us don't know that it is Yahweh that's going to visit us. It is Yahweh that is going to curse them that cursed us. It is Yahweh that is going to deliver us and bring us back under the bond of the covenant. And that covenant is the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thus, it continues to read, and please take note what it said in that fourth verse, I will be honored. If we teach somebody else is going to save us, if we teach that we can save ourselves by pulling up ourselves by our own bootstraps and reestablishing or resurrecting a covenant that is broken, then you're going to honor yourself. People are going to talk about what you did. Not so, as we read 
in Exodus, the 14th chapter, the 4th verse, for it reads again, and I will hearten Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them to destroy them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am Yahweh. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people flee and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants were turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? that we have let Israel go, no, from serving us. And don't forget how the servitude was, rigorous. And he made ready his chariot, and he took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots, all the chariots of Egypt, and captains over every one of them. And Yahweh heartened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with an high hand, but the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamping by the sea, besides Pihophra before baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew night, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were so afraid because many times we hear the word, but we don't believe it. We're not trusting in it. So that's why we become afraid. And the children of Israel cried out into Yahweh. And note the cry. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, has thy taken us away to die in the wilderness? <clears throat> Wherefore has thy dealt thus with us? to carry us forth out of Egypt. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, as our brothers is saying in America and scattered abroad, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to wait on Yahweh or to hope that he will save us like he saved our fathers, it says, then that we should die in the wilderness, the 13th verse. And please circle this verse, for this is the reassurance of those that did not trust in Yahweh. For it reads, and Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still. Don't do your own thing. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And see as we hope to see the salvation of Yahweh, which he alone will show to you today. For there is a time and season for everything under the sun, even being saved. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again, no more forever. Why? How could that be? It reads in the 14th verse. Yahweh shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. So you just supposed to stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh.
it continues to tell us. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Wherefore cried thou unto me, speaking to the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift up thy, up thy rod, and stretch out thy hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I beheld all, it says, and I beheld, or behold, I will hearten the heart of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me, not you, but I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh alone when I have gotten me, not we. He ain't speaking French. It says when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And this same salvation, is supposed to be hoped it by us. We are hoping that Yahweh get his honor upon America and wherever else we are scattered abroad. How else will we be saved? And the angel of Yahweh which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to thee. Talking about the Israelites. So that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the water were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were divided a wall unto them on the right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, Yahweh looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud, and troubled the host of the Egyptians, and took off their chariot wheels that they drove them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for Yahweh fight for them against the Egyptians. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Stretch out thy hand over the sea, that the water may come again upon the Egyptians upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians flee against it. And Yahweh overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And we are reading all of this to allow us to know, according to that 14th chapter, the 13th verse, this is what the Israelites seen. This is what it means to stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh. Thus, it continues to tell us in closing of this great sight of salvation, it says in the 28th verse, and the water returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them, but Yahweh, but excuse me, but the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea.
And the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on their left. Thus, they sing the salvation. It reads, Thus Yahweh saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw, as our presentation denotes, see the salvation of Yahweh, it reads, And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore, like a bunch of poison fish just floating. It reads, And Israel saw that great work, the great hand which Yahweh did upon the Egyptians. And the people, once they understood, once they understood truth, mercy and truth, it says, the people feared Yahweh and believed Yahweh and his servant. Most. Thus, it tells us in the 15th chapter of Exodus, if we pick up at the first verse, after the children of Israel stood still and seen the salvation of Yahweh, seen that Yahweh got honor upon our enemies, it reads, then sung Moses and the children of Israel this song. And to Yahweh, and speak, saying, I will sing it to Yahweh, for he hath trampled gloriously the horse and his rider, have he thrown into the sea. Yahweh is my strength, so is he ours. And song, this song should be in our mouth today. We should be teaching our children about Yahweh mercy and the salvation that we are waiting on. We should be teaching our children and ourselves that we will be saved out of this trouble. Thus it reads in the second verse of the 15th chapter of Exodus, Yahweh is my strength. And song, and he alone is become my salvation. He is my Elohim, and I will prepare him in habitation. My father's Elohim, and I will exalt him. Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariot and his host have he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They stink into the bottom as a sun. Excuse me. They sink into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, Yahweh, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, Yahweh, has dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thy excellency, thy has overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thy sin is forth thy wrath which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters was gathered together. The flood stood upright as in heat, and the depths were congaled in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Thou did blow, thy did blow with thy wind. The sea covered them. They sank 
as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, Yahweh, among the deities? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders? The answer is no one. Thy stretch is out thy right hand. The earth swallowed them. Thy in thy mercy, please take note about this mercy and truth that truly denotes salvation, for it tells us, Thy in thy mercy has led forth the people, which thy has redeemed. Thy has guided them in thy strength into thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestine. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thy arm, they shall be as steel as a stone. Till thy people pass over. O Yahweh, till the people pass over, which thy have purchased. Thy shall bring them in and plant them in the mountain. This denotes the attribute or what is received once you are saved. Thy shall bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thy inheritance. In the place, O Yahweh, which thy has made for thee to dwell in. The sanctuary, O Yahweh, which thy hand has established. Yahweh shall reign forever and ever. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea. And Yahweh brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. And Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dads, because they have understood that Yahweh have saved them out of their trouble. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to Yahweh, for he hath trampled gloriously the horse and his rider, have he thrown into the sea. So when we find ourselves seeking the salvation of Yahweh, when we find ourselves searching the works of Yahweh, when we try to have hope in these great words, it allows us to know that it is Yahweh alone that has ever saved his people. We're going in chronological order now. And it allows us to know that Yahweh is the only one that has saved his people to the extent that other nations know about the Creator because of this great salvation. And this salvation is so great that only Yahweh is honored for it. You think he will give his praise and glory to another? You think he will give his honor to another? If we fear him, and depart from evil, we will only hope in him doing the same thing. We teach all the time. Yahweh changes not. Well, why will he change in being the one that saves us? Sure, the Almighty will raise up a man. That's promise to lead us. But he can't do nothing without the power and the glory of Yahweh. Don't forget, he got to be raised. He got to be born and raised up. 
Then he will be instilled with the powers to lead us. But all these acts only come by way of Yahweh. We've seen that Yahweh is the one that threw them in the water. We see that Yahweh is the one that had the water to drown them. It wasn't Moses. Moses just did what Yahweh told him to do. It's Yahweh that gets the glory and the honor. And today we are honoring Yahweh and allowing the world to know that I don't care who you are. If you are saved out of this, it will only come by way of our creator. Thus, let us turn our scriptures to First Chronicles, the 16th chapter. First Chronicles, the 16th chapter. Continuing to establish the salvation of Yahweh and to show many parts of this volume or many parts of salvation that is found in the volume of our book, I would like for us to turn to First Chronicles 16. And it tells us in First Chronicles, the 16th chapter, if we all turn there, please. And what we find in First Chronicles, the 16th chapter, if we pick up at the 10th verse, it allows us to see how King David praised Yahweh. And it allows us to know that King David as the Psalms told us, we were to teach our children that he was taught and that he understood that Yahweh is our salvation, that Yahweh is the only one that could save us and David. Thus, it tells us in one of David's Psalms, if we pick up at the 10th verse, I'll start at the 9th, and it reads. Uh, uh, I refuse that. I'll start at the 7th verse. Let's start at the 7th verse, and it reads. Then on that day, David delivered first this song to thank Yahweh into the hand of Asa and his brethren. Give thanks unto Yahweh. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people as we just did. And we are making known that Yahweh changed not, that Yahweh had promised by way of covenant that I will save Abraham's seed out of the enemy's land. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing into him. Sing psalms into him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Well, one of the greatest works of Yahweh, based on the volume of the book, is salvation. He alone is thy Savior. The Almighty said he looked on both sides and he found no one. He alone is thy Savior. Thus, it continued to read. In the ninth verse, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. And we just had Brother Stephen, Brother Shemaya, and Brother Yamin speak by way of Psalms, denoting his wonderful works, dealing with salvation. The 10th verse reads, Glory ye in his holy name. 
Let the heart of them rejoice that seek Yahweh. Seek Yahweh in his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works that he have done. I already showed them. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O oh, ye seed of Israel, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He alone is Yahweh our Elohim. His judgments are in all the earth. Be ye mindful always. Always remember that Yahweh said that he will save Jacob out of his troubles. Be ye mindful always of his covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. What word is that? Even of the covenant which he made with Abraham. That's why I took us to Genesis 12 and of his oath and to Isaac, and have confirmed the same to Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. And what did that covenant denote Yahweh? It says, saying unto thee, will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance? When ye were but few, even a few, even a few, and strangers in it. And when they went from one nation, went from, went from nation to nation, and from one kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to do them wrong. Well, today, we are done wrong. Yea, he reproved kings. For their sake, saying, touch not my anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Sing unto Yahweh all the earth. Show forth from day to day. Please take note. Sing unto Yahweh all the earth. Show forth from day to day his salvation. And many of us don't. We teaching everything except Yahweh is the one going to save us. People get mad at us when we tell them to wait on your Savior. People is upset with us because we teach to fear Yahweh and to depart from evil and wait on your Savior. And they should ask us, well, where did you get that from? And we are to tell them, this is the words of our creator. These are the things that we are supposed to witness day to day. Thus, it reads again in the 23rd verse, sing unto Yahweh, all the earth. All the earth, not just his chosen, all the earth, if you make it, if you make it out of Yahweh's judgment, it will be Yahweh that save you. Thus it reads again, sing unto Yahweh all the earth, show forth from day to day, his salvation. And if we did, especially our teachers, we would never consider what is found in the New Testament. We would never have the idea that somebody died and going to come back to life and save us. But since we were not singing unto Yahweh, showing forth from day to day his salvation, we have the audacity to think. Somebody that couldn't save themselves is going to save us. Declare his glory among the heathen as we are doing this day. His marvelous works among all nations. For great is Yahweh and greatly 
to be praised. He also is to be feared above all deities. For all the deities of the people are idols. But Yahweh, the creator of the heaven and earth, made the heavens. Glory and honor are in his presence. Because he is the only one known in history, known as they teach about the pantheon of the God, he is the only one that has taken a people from another people that was stronger than them and made them his people and gave them the glory of all lands. Look it up. Find me another so-called little G-O-D that is honored in such majesty. You can't because there is only one creator. All the other ones that you have created in your imagination is only idols. But Yahweh made the heaven. Glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. Given to Yahweh, you kindreds of the people, our cousins, or whoever it is, whoever y'all trying to be, and grab into us. The Almighty says, The Almighty said, give unto Yahweh, ye kindred of the people, give unto Yahweh glory and strength. Give unto Yahweh the glory due unto his name. And the name Yahweh is, was used in the day of salvation. Give unto Yahweh the glory due into his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship Yahweh in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice, and let men say among the nations, Yahweh reigns. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice in all that is therein. Then shall the trees of the wood sing out at the presence of Yahweh, because he comes to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks unto Yahweh, for he is good. For what? His mercy endures forever. And say ye, please say no. And say ye, save us, Yahweh, of our salvation. And gather us together. And note, deliver us from the heathen. That we, please take note when you become the sons and daughters of Yahweh when you are saved. So you better be hoping that Yahweh is the only one that can save us. For it reads, And say ye, save us, Yahweh, of our salvation, and gather us together, and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks unto thy holy name, and glory in thy praise. Blessed be Yahweh Elohim of Israel. How long? Forever and ever. And all the people, once they believe and once they understand the salvation of Yahweh, it reads, Blessed be Yahweh Elohim of Israel forever and ever. And all the people especially those that see the salvation of Yahweh, said, Amen.
and praise ye Yahweh, or it reads, Amen and Hallelujah. It also tells us, dealing with the volume of the book, dealing with this great attribute that no one else has in the entire universe, if we take a look at Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter. Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter. And as I stated earlier in the beginning of the presentation, uh, that the word and the term salvation has over 353 references found throughout the entire Holy Scriptures. And here is another reference. That can be found in Second Chronicles, the twentieth chapter. If we all turn there, please. And it tells us in Second Chronicles, the twentieth chapter, I'll start at the first verse. I haven't read this story in a long time. But I think it's a story that you all would truly enjoy to allow you to know how we are to have our faith, our hope, in the only one that has ever saved anyone. Why put my stock in someone that tells me that they can save me? instead of having my stock in the one that have saved. There's only one person, one entity that have saved. This story that we find and we just declared in the book, from the book of Exodus, the whole world know this story. The Holy Scripture has been transli transliterated in every language. So they read the same story. It just have different words. They just read it based on their lip, their language. It says the same thing. It only talk about one creator. No matter what language you speak. So this is a great story. And it allows us to know when we truly trust in Yahweh, and understand that he is our Savior, we're going to always stand still and wait on him. Thus, let's start at the first verse of Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter. And it reads, it reads in Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter, the very first verse, It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them others besides the Amorites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. And they must didn't know about what was sung in Exodus the 15th chapter when when. Uh, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, and all the people were singing and praising Yahweh. Well, Moab was mentioned, and Edom was mentioned. And it allows us to know that we understood as a people that Yahweh will fight for us, even against Moab, even against Ammon, even against Canaan. Thus, it tells us that Ammon and Moab, besides the Amorites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Jehoshaphat is a king of Yahweh. 
does it read. And he got the same blessing on him just like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had. And that blessing is he that blessed thee shall be blessed. He that cursed thee shall be cursed. And when he cursed you, it's to bring forth his children. It denotes salvation. Thus it reads. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There comes a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be at Hazron, Tamar, which is in Gedal, and Jehoshaphat feared and set himself no to seek Yahweh. All the trials and tribulations that befall us, all the angry spirits, all the trials and tribulations, all the oppression, we should be like Jehoshaphat. When these things come upon us, we shouldn't gather together and see how we can outdo the heathen, how we can get around the laws and the unfairness and the unjust things that they apply upon us. Instead, we should do as our brother did. And what did he do? It reads in the third verse, and Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek Yahweh and proclaimed a fast throughout all Yehuda. And Yehuda gathered to themselves together to ask help of Yahweh. They ain't gathered themselves together and say, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to march to Washington. We're going to tell uh, the, the president, the letter, no, no, no because that wouldn't represent the glory of Elohim. Thus, it continued to read, to ask help of Yahweh, even out of all the cities of Yehuda, they came to seek Yahweh. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Yehuda, in Jerusalem, in the house of Yahweh, before the new court, and said, Yahweh Elohim of our fathers, art not thy Yahweh in heaven, and rule not thy over all the kingdoms of the heathen? Absolutely. And in thy hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to, to withstand thee. Now, if you got all this knowledge, why would you call on anyone else to save you? How could somebody deceive you to believe in anyone other than this? It continues to read. Art not thy, our Elohim, who did drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel and giveth it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever as you have promised? And they dwelt therein and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil come upon us, as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house. And cry, note, not pray, but cry into thee in our affliction. Are we not afflicted today? Are not the affliction of the people only denotes evil. It says, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thy alone 
will hear and help. And now, behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Sir, whom thy would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they rewarded us to come to cast us out of thy possession which thy has given us to inherit. O our Elohim, will thy not judge them? For we have not, for we have no might against this great company that come against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And that's the same with us today. Many of us don't know what to do. But even in your lack of knowledge, you are still supposed to wait and hope in what your creator has done for your fathers. We hope and wait that he will do the same to us. And it allows us to know in the book of Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, the 34th to the 40th verse, that he promised to, to plead with us with our fathers that find themselves in another man's land as he pleaded with your fathers when he brought them out of Egypt. That's why we hope in these words. That's why we keep bringing up the deeds that Yahweh have done. We have no other deeds to use. We don't want no other deeds to use. We want to hope in what he said and done. Thus it reads. I lost my way. One second. It says, in the 13th verse, and all you who stood before Yahweh with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Then upon Yahziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Yael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite, the son of Asher, came the spirit of Yahweh in the midst of the congregation. And he said, note, and he said, hearken ye, all Yehuda, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thy king, Jehoshaphat, thus said Yahweh unto you, be not afraid. That's what he told our fathers in Egypt. Nor dismay by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but Yahweh. So when Yahweh save us, it's not going to be your battle. It's his. He got you. He is remembering the covenant that he made with our fathers. He is giving respect into your cry and the affliction that he has seen. It reads, Tomorrow, the 16th verse of the Second Chronicles chapter 20. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Z, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Urel. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still. The exact same words that was said in Exodus, the 14th chapter, the 13th verse, it reads, Stand ye still and see the salvation of Yahweh with you, O Yehuda and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed, 
Tomorrow, go out against them, for Yahweh will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Yehuda and inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before Yahweh, worshiping Yahweh. And the Levites, the children of Korahite, and of the children of Korite, stood up to praise Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, with a loud voice on high. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness wilderness of Tekoa. And and as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Yehuda, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe. Believe in this report. It says, Believe in Yahweh your Elohim. So shall ye be established. Other than that, you will never be saved out of this. You can call on Jesus all you want. I guarantee you don't get saved. It reads, Believe in Yahweh your Elohim, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And that's the only way we can prosper, by us bringing up these words and believing in them. Many of us, have been recipients of his mercy this day. We don't have to tell our trials and tribulations, but we know how we got out of them. It reads, And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers into Yahweh, and that should, that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, Hallelujah! for his mercy endures forever. No. Here go this great mercy. And when they begin to sing and to praise Yahweh, and to sing and to praise, Yahweh set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Sir, which were come against Yehuda, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon, Moab stood up against the inhabitants, of Mount Sir, utterly to slay and to destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Sir, every one helped to destroy another. And when Yehuda came toward the watchtowers in the wilderness, they looked into the multitude, and behold, they were dead bodies falling to the earth, and none escaped. No. Nope. What was told to Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel, that to stand still, you won't have to fight. Even though they might have put their weapons on and all that, they didn't get in the battle. Because Yahweh said, for the battle is not yours, but Yahweh. Thus it tells us in the 25th verse, and when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering of the spoil. Look at the reward for trusting in Yahweh, for waiting on Yahweh, for having the understanding that Yahweh is thy Savior. It was so much the 26th verse, and on the fourth day, they assembled themselves in the valley of Barakiah, for there they blessed Yahweh. Therefore, the name of the same place was called the valley of Barakiah, and to this day. Then they returned, every man of Yehuda and Jerusalem, and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them, to go again to Jerusalem with joy, because they had been a recipient of Yahweh's salvation. For Yahweh had made them to rejoice over their enemies. And they came to Jerusalem with pastries and harps and trumpets and to the house of Yahweh. And the fear of Yahweh was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they had heard 
that Yahweh fought against the enemies of Israel. So the realm of Jehoshaphat or the reign of Jehoshaphat was quiet. For Yahweh gave him rest round about. So this is a testimony of the times of Israel being in their land and the enemies oppressing them, where Yahweh spoke just like he spoke in Exodus, the 14th chapter, the 13th verse, and told them the exact same words, stand still and watch the salvation of Yahweh. It also tells us, if we take a look in the days of Isaiah, if we turn to Isaiah, the 41st chapter, Isaiah, the 41st chapter, the volume of the book, and even though we can, we can declare it by way of the volume of the book, this, this great attribute of Yahweh is not being declared out of our mouths. We believe in another doctrine. We believe that we can save ourselves. And please take down the note when I take you somewhere and the Almighty said, I saved them because of what they did. Besides saving them, because of the covenant that I made with them. Isaiah 41. And it tells us in the days of Isaiah, if we take a look at the 41st chapter, and let's pick up at the 10th verse. And let's read to the 14th verse, Isaiah 41, verse 10, and it reads, I'll love to start at the, sorry about that, let's start at the 8th verse, and we will read to the 14 verse, and it reads, But thy, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend, thy, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth. And he's going to take us from the ends of the earth again if we believe it. And call thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thy art my servant. I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Fear thy not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, even though you see in all this hell, even though you find yourself uh, 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 afflicted, oppressed, uh, diseased with mental illness. It says, fear thy not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy Elohim. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incented against thee shall be ashamed and confounded, especially those that said they will be saved another way. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. So those that striving with those that preach that Yahweh will save you, that Yahweh is your salvation, they will perish and they will not be saved. It reads, Thou shalt seek them 
and shall not find them, even them that contend with thee. They that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of not. Why? For I, Yahweh, thy Elohim, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not. I alone, Yahweh, will help thee. Fear not thy worm, Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I alone will help thee, said Yahweh, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. It also tells, tells us in the days of Isaiah, if we take a look at the 45th chapter, because I said that when it talks about them being ashamed and confounded, those that was incented against those that teach that Yahweh will save us, that we are to only seek Yahweh, that Yahweh will be our help, those that spoke against those words shall be ashamed. Well, where else does it say that at? If we take a look at Isaiah, the 45th chapter. And let's pick up at the 20th verse. And this is not just for those among Israel that don't believe, but it's definitely speaking against the Gentiles. And the Gentiles is just the other nations. Well, let's see what Isaiah said to them. And it reads in the 20th verse of Isaiah, the 45th chapter, we're going to read to the 25th verse. Thus it reads, Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image. And no, pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. I don't care what you call your group. I don't care if you're Judaism, Christianism, Islamism, all those isms and schisms, the Almighty said, bring them up. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who have declared this from ancient times? According to where I took us, it is none other than Yahweh. We started in Genesis. The question is, who have told it from ancient times? Who have told it from that time? Have not I, Yahweh, alone? And please take note and witness for your creator. And there is no God else besides me. A Jeff Elohim. And what? It reads in your book, and a Savior. It should be, and thy Savior. There is none besides me. He telling us in the world, look into me and be ye saved to all the ends of the earth. Why? For I am Yahweh and there is none else. I have sworn by myself. Well, you can drop that New Testament. You can drop the trinity. You can drop the two-piece. It says, I have sworn by myself. The word that your brother is teaching you today is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That's why I can't nobody correct me. That's why if you truly fear Yahweh and depart from evil, you got to say Yahweh is our salvation. I have sworn by myself, 
the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. Please take note. They lied to you in the New Testament. They told you to bow down to a dead man. It says that unto me, Yahweh, not we, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall swear. And what is it, and why is it that every knee shall bow? And every tongue shall swear. What is it that you should be swearing? You should be swearing that Yahweh is our salvation. It reads, Surely shall one say, In Yahweh have I righteousness and strength. Even to him alone shall men come. And all that are incentive, and we just read about somebody being incentive against us teaching that Yahweh is the only Savior, it says again, surely shall one say, and Yahweh have our righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come. And all that are incentive, angry against him shall be ashamed. And Yahweh shall the house of Yeseron and those that teach Yahweh is the only salvation shall be justified. Thus the last verse reads, and Yahweh shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. Long as you are out here witnessing that Yahweh is salvation, Yahweh is our only Savior, Yahweh will help us. You're going to be justified. Those that teach other than that, Yahweh has spoken. You can't, nor will you ever be justified. Isaiah also spoke and continue to speak in that wise if we take a look at the 49th chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah was a great prophet, and he knew the honor and the greatness and the righteousness of his creator, and he had the, the Holy Spirit upon him to preach and teach to his brothers and sisters that your creator is the only Savior, not just of you, but of the world. For he is the only one that made it. Isaiah 49. And it tells us in Isaiah 49, I'll just read one verse. And the verse that I would love to display is found in the sixth verse. I'll start at the fifth and read to the sixth. And now, said Yahweh, that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him, and it's talking about somebody that he is establishing, somebody that he has put a Holy Spirit on, somebody that he has made a Mashika to lead his people. And this leading denotes salvation that Yahweh is giving. Thus, it continues to read, bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of Yahweh, and my Elohim shall be my strength. And he said, it is a light thing that thy should be my servant to raise up the tribe of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles 
that thy mayest be my salvation. How long? Where at? And to the ends of the earth. It also tells us in Isaiah, if we take a look at the 51st chapter, Isaiah 51. And it tells us in Isaiah 51, if we pick up at the fifth verse, and let's read to the twelfth verse. Isaiah 51, 5 to 12. And it reads, my righteousness, I'll start at the fourth, sorry about that, Isaiah 51 and 4 to 12, hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O oh, my nation, a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near. Please take note. My salvation is gone forth. And my arm shall judge the people. The owl shall wait upon me. And on my arm shall they trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like matter. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Hearken unto me, that righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law, fear ye not the reproach of men. Neither be ye afraid of their rebelling, for the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. So no matter what generation you find yourself in, if you are saved out of Jacob's trouble, it will only come by way of Yahweh's salvation. Thus it continue to read. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of Yahweh. Awake, as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Art thy not it that we had wounded the dragon? And those things were done in the wilderness. Are thy not it which dried up the sea? the waters of the great death that has made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over. That happened in Egypt. Therefore, the redeemed of Yahweh shall return and come with singing into Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head because they're going to be a recipient of salvation. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and note what they were saved from shall not be on them anymore. It reads, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. I, even I, am he that comforts you. Who are thy that thy should be afraid of a man that shall die? and of the Son of Man, which shall be made as grass. Well, one of the rumors is that somebody going to die and come back to life. What Almighty is telling his children, don't you dare pay attention to that. Don't you dare fear a man and, and his rumors that shall die. 
So he's giving us a warning right here. Why is we fearing the dead? You are the children of the living Elohim. You're supposed to fear the living. You don't supposed to worry about a dead man, and you don't supposed to have your thoughts all about what's going to happen to you die. Your thoughts should be on the living. And when you do, Trust in these words, it lets us know in the 13th verse. I know I said I'm going to stop at the 12th, but let's read the 13th verse. It says, because when you do trust in man, somebody that's going to die, somebody that withers away like grass, it says, you wind up forgetting Yahweh thy maker that has stretched forth the heaven and laid the foundations of the earth and has feared continually, every day, because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? When the Almighty save you, that, is, that disappears. They have no strength. And we understand that by the story we just read with our King Jehoshaphat. Give me one second. I need to change this phone. Give me one second, please. It continues to tell us in the book of Isaiah, if we take a look at the 52nd chapter of Isaiah. The 52nd chapter of Isaiah tells us if we pick up at the 7th verse, and let's read. To the 12th verse. Isaiah 52, verse 7 to 12. And it reads, How beautiful upon the mountains, Isaiah 52, verse 7 to 12. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him, that bring good time and the great time that we are bringing today, that we are declaring today, is that Yahweh is our Savior. We are speaking about the salvation of Yahweh. Thus the seventh verse reads, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bring good time that publish peace, that brings good times of good, that publish salvation, that say into the daughters of Zion, thy Elohim reign. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. Those that are truly witnessing, for they shall see eye to eye when Yahweh shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For Yahweh hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. Yahweh hath made bare his holy arm. In the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see what? The salvation of your Elohim. Not theirs, 
not some creature or idol that they have bowed down to, but all the nations, all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our Elohim. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels in the words of Yahweh, for ye shall not go out with haste, even though you're being a recipient of salvation, even though you're being saved, it thou does the know. And it was dealing with Israel going into Babylon, but it allows us to know, for ye shall not go out with hate, nor go by flight, for Yahweh will go before you, as he did with Moses, and as he did with Jehoshaphat. And Yahweh of Israel will be your reward. It also tells us about salvation and another reference to salvation of this 353 references. Let's take a look in the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah. And let's go to the third chapter. We're not going to touch nor be able to touch all 353 references of Yahweh's salvation that is found in the volume of the book. Thus, your brother have brought forth these particular chapters and verses to tell the story about our creator and the salvation that he extends based under the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this covenant lasts forever. Thus, whatever generation you find yourself in, you are to hope in this great salvation. Jeremiah, the third chapter. And it tells us in this third chapter, if we pick up at the 12th verse, Jeremiah 3, verse 12, and it reads, Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thy backsliding Israel, said Yahweh, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, said Yahweh. See how mercy and truth work together, how one wind up being a recipient of salvation. For I am merciful, said Yahweh, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thy iniquity that thy has transgressed it against Yahweh thy Elohim and has scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. And I like to make a note on this. When it talk about scattering thy way to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, said Yahweh. Well, one of our dear sisters, as many of us find ourselves trying to help our brothers and sisters that we come in contact with, to try to show them what does say Yahweh only, uh, have been talking to other brothers and sisters, trying to help them. And in particular, these people are called by Judaism. There are a lot of Judaisms. Just dealing with Judaism itself, there are many branches of Judaism. Whatever ism or schism it is, because our brothers and sisters are calling themselves by many forms of religion. Um, but how did these people 
come under such religions. Well, the Christians say they grafted to the tradition of Israel. Well, there's no different with the Judaism. Judaism is another form of religion, and that's all they have done. All they have done is grafted themselves to the traditions of Israel. So they find themselves partaking and portraying different uh, traditions of Israel. But that don't make them Israelites. It makes them what they call themselves, Judaism. And many of the Judaisms uh, come by way of the so-called European Jews. We all know the three largest religions in the world are Christianity, known as Yahwehism. Now one of them denote themselves of being Israel. Many of those books, they denote that they are not Israel. When they speak about Israel, the, the Christian book speaks about the Israelites. The Islamic book speaks about the Israelites. It, taught, it, tells, it tells you that they are the chosen of the Most High. And Judaism, the other third religion, in their books talk about the Israelites. So all three of those major religions are nothing but, but grafted. They are people that have taken hold of the Israelite traditions and claimed them for themselves. They are not Israel. And many of our brothers and sisters today, born in captivity, have cleaved to those traditions. And they are actually believing that they are the true Israelite. In reality, you are nothing but a copycat. You are nothing but one that has tried to steal the true identity of the sons and daughters of Israel. So, as I stated to my sister, I would like to state to the listening audience, when you find yourself up against these isms and they speak another language, meaning they don't confirm every word, make them show the chapter and the verse. Make them to be able to justify themselves. And if they can't, just keep confirming the word. Because the Almighty told us in Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, the ninth and the 10th verse, call all your witnesses. And we just read something similar to that in Isaiah 45, in verse 20. Call all your witnesses and produce your cause. And if you can't produce your cause, then you, that truly fear Yahweh, that truly depart from evil, is to say what my sister had brought forth is only the truth. You don't supposed to keep fighting them. You can allow them to speak if they want. You can allow them to bring up all these ads and diminishing. But after they do, make sure you let them know that they have not justified themselves. And since you have not justified yourself, I don't care if you call yourself a Christian. I don't care if you call yourself a Muslim. I don't care if you call yourself a Jew. You are to fear Yahweh and to depart from evil and say that this is the truth. And the only thing that we are acknowledging as the truth is thus said 
Yahweh. If you can't show me, does say Yahweh, you a Jew. If you can't show me, does say Yahweh, you a Christian. If you can't show me, does say Yahweh, you a Muslim, then those words are to be thrown behind you. And you, as a witness, is only supposed to confirm that which you find written from Genesis to Malachi. And when you do, it only denotes Yahweh and the children of Israel. And it denotes that Yahweh made a covenant with his children, with his children and they were under every word of that covenant. So if you got some other children saying that we under it, and they ain't under every word, According to Proverbs 35 and 6, they shall be found a liar. So rest in Yahweh. When you're talking to your brothers and sisters, trust in Yahweh. And make your brothers and sisters show you the chapter and verses why they teach that they are someone other than Yahweh have ever spoken about. I just wanted to throw that in because it just hit my mind, and this was a good verse to use it on. Because, again, it tells us in the 13th verse of the third chapter of Jeremiah, only acknowledge thy iniquity, that thy has transgressed against Yahweh thy Elohim, and has scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice, said Yahweh. Turn, O backsliding children, said Yahweh, for I am married to you and to you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family. And I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And if you have been fed with knowledge and understanding, you should truly know that Yahweh is thy salvation. You should truly know that Jacob will be saved out of this. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, said Yahweh, they shall say no more the art of the covenant of Yahweh, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of Yahweh, and all the nations shall be gathered into it, to the name of Yahweh, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. In those days, the house of Yehuda shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance and to your father. But I have said, but I said, how should I put these among the children and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the host of the nations? And I said, thy shall call me my father and shall not turn away from me. Surely, as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, please take note, surely, as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have ye dwelt, dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, said Yahweh. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping in supplication of the children of Israel, for they had perverted their way, and they had forgotten Yahweh their Elohim. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come into thee 
for thy art Yahweh, our Elohim. Truly in vain, please take note, if you trust in the New Testament, if you have been taught to trust in the New Testament, it is vanity. Thus the 23rd verse reads, truly in vain is salvation hoped from the from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in Yahweh our Elohim is the salvation of Israel. Period. Jeremiah also said, if we take a look at the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, he also continued to witness for his creator, as we should. In the book of Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, and let's start reading this truth and this witnessing from the first verse. And we will read to the 14th verse. And it reads, Jeremiah 31, verse 1. But before we read Jeremiah 31, right before Jeremiah 31, we find Jeremiah 30. And let's just witness what is said in the seventh verse. And what we find in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the times of Jacob's trouble. But please take note, he shall be saved. Another reference to salvation. He shall be saved out of it. Now let's go to 31, verse 1. And it reads, after we just heard that, at the same time, said Yahweh, will I be the Elohim of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus said Yahweh, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness. Even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. Yahweh have appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, the reason why, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Again, I will build thee, and thy shall be built. O virgin of Israel, thy shall again be adorned with thy tempers, and shall go forth in the dance of them that make merry. Thy shall yet plant vines upon the mountain of Samaria, and the planters shall plant, and shall eat them as common things. For there shall be a day that the watchmen upon the Mount Ephraim should cry, Arise ye, let us go up to Zion and to Yahweh our Elohim. For thus say Yahweh, Sing with gladness for Jacob. Shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, Yahweh, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth and with them the blind and the lame. No, all of us, the woman with child and her that travels with child together, a great company shall return. Tired. They shall come with weeping and with supplications Will I leave them? I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. 
Hear the word of Yahweh, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off. And say, as we say, he that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For Yahweh have redeemed Jacob and ransomed him. From the hand, this denotes salvation, from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the heights of Zion, and shall flow together to the goodness of Yahweh, for wheat and for wine, and for all, and for the young of the flock and of the herd, and their soul shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. And I will saturate the soul of the priestess with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with the goodness of this great salvation, said Yahweh. We also find a form of salvation that denotes a spiritual salvation. And where we can find reference to these this type of salvation, a spiritual salvation, is in Psalms 51. If we all turn there, please. Psalms 51, and let's read the first four verses, which will denote a spiritual salvation. Psalms 51. And it tells us in Psalms 51, the first four verses that denote a spiritual salvation. It reads, Have mercy upon me, Yahweh, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. But still, even if it's spiritual or physical, it still denotes the covenant that Yahweh made with Abraham, and it still denotes his tender mercies. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, please take note, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thy mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thy judges. So here denotes a spiritual uh, salvation. Uh, based on the prayers that one makes, it continue to tell us in the A verse, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thy has broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sin and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O Yahweh, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. The last verse is the 12th verse that I will read, and it says, Restore unto me the joy of thy, what? Salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. 
Another place that denotes spiritual salvation is also found in Psalms. Let's turn to Psalm 79. Coming to a close, I think, Psalm 79 right now, and it tells us in Psalm 79, if we pick up at the 8th verse, and let's read the 8th. To the 13th verse, Psalm 79, verse 8 says, Oh, remember not against, oh, remember not against us former iniquities. Let thy tender mercy speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. Help us, Yahweh, of our salvation, for the glory of thy name. And deliver us and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is their Elohim? Let him be known among the heathen in our sight by the revenging of the blood of thy servants, which is shed. And I stated earlier, we are dying every day. Our sons and daughters are like wild bulls in a net on every corner. We are dying every day. Our children are being shot. They in their bed sleep, five years old, nine years old, and they being killed. So here it says, wherefore should the heathen say, where is their Elohim? These things can't happen if their Elohim is saving them. Let him be known among the heathen. And the heathen is bold with it. It reads, in our sight, by the revenging, taking vengeance of the blood of thy servant, which is shed every day. Let the sign of the prisoner come before thee, according to the greatness of thy power. Preserve thy, those that are appointed to death. And render into our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom their reproach wherewith they have reproached thee, O Master. So we, thy people, and the sheep of thy pastor, will give thee thanks for what? Forever we will show forth thy praise to all generations, because thy have saved us. Because we have seen the salvation of Yahweh. And one more place that denotes spiritual salvation is found in Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. Let us turn to Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. And it tells us in Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, if we take a look, at the 23rd verse. The 23rd verse tells us in Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I, Yahweh, alone, will save them, salvation, out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them, so shall they be my people, and I will be their Elohim. That's the same thing that the Almighty said in the book of Exodus. When he saved his people, they became his children, and he became their Elohim. Same things is being said in Ezekiel 37, dealing with the spirituality of the people. It denotes a spiritual salvation. We also find and that our fathers understood 
that the sal- that the salvation was truly denoted as a covenant relationship with Yahweh to where our fathers, maybe not our brothers and sisters today, but our fathers in their days did understand, many of them, that salvation was a covenant relationship with Yahweh. You're supposed to save your children. You're supposed to save your wife. And and we were a covenant people with our creator as children. We was a covenant people to our creator as a wife. So in this covenant, the man was supposed to save. Let's take a quick look at Psalms. 33, and let me give you an idea of what your brother is trying to teach today. Salvation denotes a covenant relationship, and we understood that our salvation only came by way of this covenant, this relationship that we have with the only one that can save. Psalms 33, and let's take a look at the 16th to the 19th verse. Psalms 33. And it tells us in Psalms 33, if we pick up at the 16th verse, and it reads to the 19th verse. There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. So they are acknowledging that the salvation is only coming by way of this covenant relationship. Even the king acknowledges, and we know that to be true, by way of the words of King Jehoshaphat. Well, here in Psalms 33, The 16th to the 19th verse reads, There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. And horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eyes of Yahweh is upon you that fear him. Upon them, note, that hope in his salvation, that hope in his mercy, to deliver their souls from death and to keep, note, them alive and fat. So here, I'll go ahead and read the rest of it because it all denotes and that denotes that they understood that they were being saved by Yahweh only, by way of this great covenant that he had made with them. Thus, the 20th verse says, our soul wait for Yahweh. He is our help and our shield, for our heart shall rejoice in him because we and know who the we is. And what the we is doing, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, Yahweh, be upon us according as we hope in thee. And we are hoping and preaching today that the salvation, about the salvation of Yahweh. None of We ain't talking about no other saving Israel nor anyone else. There is none that have a track record of saving except Yahweh, the Elohim of the Hebrews. Search the history. Search in the pantheon, the gods, or whatever they call that mess and you will find no record of any entity saving 
people. But Yahweh, the Elohim of the Hebrews and the entire universe. Thus, I got another example. Let's take a look at Isaiah 30. Proving without a shadow of a doubt, our people understood that salvation denoted a covenant relationship with Yahweh. Isaiah 30. It was a little work you had to do. And the work you had to do is believe. Isaiah 30. And it tells us in Isaiah 30, and we take a look at the 15th verse. And it allows us to know in the 15th verse of Isaiah 30, and it reads, for thus said Yahweh Elohim, the Holy One of Israel, and returning and rest, and returning and rest, it's another way of saying stand still, shall ye be saved. Salvation and quietness and in confidence shall be. Be your strength, and ye would not. So it allows us to know that what denoted this great salvation is a relationship. Let me continue reading. But ye said, no, for we will flee upon horses. You depended on the horses. Therefore shall ye flee. And we will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one. At the rebuke of five shall ye flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain, and as an ensign on a hill. And therefore will Yahweh wait. And therefore will Yahweh wait that he may be gracious unto you. And therefore will he be exalted, that he have mercy upon you. For Yahweh is a Elohim of judgment. And please circle this for all those that teach we are under the covenant of the law, and Yahweh do not require us to execute judgment. For here it tells us, for Yahweh is a Elohim of judgment. Blessed, not cursed. Blessed are all you that wait for him. And what are you waiting on? Salvation. You wait to be saved. I got one more for you. I think we might have said it. I'm not going to use it. But the other one we already went, and that was found in Isaiah 45, 22. I already used it in another part of our presentation, so I'm not going to read it again. But I, you can write it down. Isaiah 45, 22 allows us to know that this salvation is based upon a covenant relationship with our Creator. And all of these things, as we have read, came by way of Yahweh grace, which many of you hate to use because you have been snared in the New Testament. But all of these things that we have read came by way of grace. It came by way of mercy. Thus, let us turn our scriptures to Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54. We got a few more chapters and verses to bring forth. And we will close this great presentation, which is called See the Salvation of Yahweh. Right now, we all should find ourselves in the book of Isaiah, the 54th chapter. And we are already in Isaiah, so turn to the 54th chapter. And 
and it reads. If we pick up at the very first verse, sing, O Baron, thy that did not bear, did did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thy that did not travel with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, said Yahweh. But you're going to be saved out of this. See, this is a situation you need to be saved out of. And as we stated earlier in the presentation, we're using this presentation as a similitude based on us. We're using this presentation as a parallel based on us, that we can show the holy from the unholy, the right from the wrong. Well, in this first verse, it denotes us. It is more of us, of the desolate, than the children of the married wife. It is more of us single. It is more houses ran by single moms than by that which is right, and that will be the married mom. But what we are reading in Isaiah 54 displays Yahweh love toward Israel, so they're going to be saved out of this. The second verse reads, Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitation. Spare not. Lifting thy cords and stripping thy stakes, for thy shall break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thy shall not be ashamed. You ain't going to be ashamed because you teach that Yahweh is going to save us. Neither be thy confounded. For thy shall not be put to shame. For thy shall forget the shame of thy youth. That's being of the unmarried. And shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. For thy maker is thy husband. Yahweh of hosts is his name. And thy redeemer. And that's what he do every time he saves you the Holy One of Israel, the Elohim of the whole earth shall he be called because he will be the only one that can save anyone that is found in the earth. For Yahweh have called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit. That's the same thing that Moses and them was. When Moses told the words to the people, they said they did not hearken to Moses because of this, because of the angry spirit and because of the oppression. Well, here it says in the sixth verse of the 54th chapter of Isaiah, for Yahweh have called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thy was refused said thy Elohim. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face, so every time he mad, he, he, he hides himself, so your prayers and all the things you think you're doing ain't for nothing if you ain't walking around fearing Yahweh and depart from evil. For it says, I hid my face from thee for a moment. But with salvation, with his mercy, it reads, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy upon thee, say Yahweh, thy redeemer. For this, is as the waters of Noah. Was not Noah a recipient of salvation? 
and to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I will not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed. But my kindness, my grace, my mercy, my loving kindness, my truth, my righteousness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the what? Covenant of my peace be removed, say Yahweh, that have mercy upon thee. It also tells us, if we take a look at the 55th chapter of Isaiah, and let's read the first three verses. The 55th chapter of Isaiah, the first three verses read, Ho, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters. And he that have no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money? for that which is not bread, that which cannot save, and your labor for that which satisfied not, which bring forth no salvation, hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good. And what is more good than knowing that Yahweh will save us? And let your soul delight itself in that. The last verse, I will read the third verse, and it reads, Incline your ear, and come and me, come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. So all of this gathering, all of this saving, all of these acts of salvation truly come by way of Yahweh's mercy. And before we go to the next part, I, something is hitting me in my head, and I want to display it. That way you can understand what I understand. It tells us in the book of Jeremiah, the 19th chapter, or 9th chapter, let me get there first. I just see it in my head. Yes, the ninth, the ninth chapter. Jeremiah, the ninth chapter, the 23rd and 24th verse reads, Thus said Yahweh, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but this is what you should always know and understand about your creator. But let him that glory, glory in this, that he understand and know me. I understand and I know that only Yahweh will save us. That I am Yahweh, which exercise what? Loving kindness judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things, Yahweh said, I delight, said Yahweh. So again, don't talk about how strong you is. Don't talk about how rich you is. Talk about how much you truly understand your creator and understand who will save us and why he will save us. Because Yahweh mercy endures forever, and you will never find Yahweh as a liar lying to his friend Abraham. He already said that I will save you. Let us turn our scriptures to the book of Lamentation. The book of Lamentation. And let's take a look at the third chapter of Lamentation. Lamentation. 
which is more words of Jeremiah. It's just the book that is known to Jeremiah where he did most of his lamentations, where he did most of his, his crying. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. Thus, let's see what Jeremiah weeped about and what he had faith in. And let's start from the third the third chapter of Lamentation, and let's read from the first verse. Just like we read from the first chapter of Exodus, and it showed the different afflictions and the reasons why the Israelites was crying and needed to be saved. Same here with, with Jeremiah in the third chapter of Lamentation. Thus it reads in the first verse. And we will be reading to the 32nd verse. And it reads, I am the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wealth. He has led me and brought me into darkness. And when we read this, just think about yourself. He has led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me is he turned. He turned his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin have he made old. He has broken my bones. He has built against me and oppressed, excuse me, encompassed me with gall and travail. He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He has hedged me about that I cannot get out. He has made my chains heavy. Also, when I cry and shout, he shut it out my prayers. He has enclosed my ways with heaved stone. He has made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a, a bear lying in wait, and as a lion in secret places. He had turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He had made me desolate. He had bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. He had caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my ruins. I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. He had filled me with bitterness. He had made me drunken with wormwood. He had also broken my teeth with gravel stone. He had covered me with ashes. And thy has removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope. Is perished from Yahweh, remembering my afflictions and misery, the wormwood and gall. My soul had them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, have I hope. It is of Yahweh's mercy that we are not consumed, that we were able to wake up this day because his compassion fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Yahweh is our portion, said my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. Yahweh is good and to them that wait for him, to the soul that seek him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of Yahweh. It is good for a man that he should bear the yoke of his youth, because ain't nothing you can do about it anyway. But in knowing that you're going through, you're still supposed to hope and wait in Yahweh's salvation. 
Thus the 27th verse read, It is good for a man that he shall bear the yoke of his youth. He sitteth alone and keeps silent, because he hath borne it upon him. He put his mouth in the dust, if so be there may be hope. He gives his cheek to him that smite him. He is filled full with reproach. For Yahweh will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion. According, please take note, to the multitude of his mercies. It also tells us, based on this great salvation and the multitude of his mercies, if we turn our scriptures to Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60. And what we find in Isaiah 60, if we pick up at the 18th verse, and it reads, Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thy shall call thy walls salvation, and thy gate praise. The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. But Yahweh shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy Elohim thy glory. The sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. For Yahweh shall be thy everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. Thy people also, once you are saved, shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hand, that I, Yahweh, alone may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand once they are saved, and a small one a strong nation. I, Yahweh, will hazard it in his time. For again, Israel, there are a time and a season for everything under the sun, even being saved. In closing, let us take a look while we're still in Isaiah. Let's read Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62. And we are doing good time. It's only 830, so I'll go ahead and give these last three places that I have. Right now, we should find ourselves in Isaiah 62. And it reads, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burns. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory. And thy shall be called by a new name, no more nigger, which the mouth of Yahweh shall name. Thy shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of Yahweh, a royal downdom in the hand of thy Elohim. Thy shall no more be turned forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be turned desolate, because you are saved and brought back. But thy shall be called Hezebub. Hezebub means 
That is, my delight is in her. That is Mary, for it says, Thy shall be called Hesba, which means again, my delight is in her. And the land, Brula, which means married. For Yahweh delight in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoice over the bride, so shall Yahweh rejoice over thee. I have set watchmen upon the walls of Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of Yahweh, keep not silent, and give him no rest, no, till he establish until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And he got to save you for that. And Yahweh is sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength. Surely I will no more give thy corn to be meat for thy enemies, and the sons of the strangers shall not drink thy wine. For that which thy has labored, but they that have gathered it shall eat it. And praise Yahweh, and they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. Go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Behold, Yahweh have proclaimed into the end of the world. Say ye to the daughters of Zion, Behold, thy salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. And they, you, shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of Yahweh. And thy shall be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Once you are a recipient, or once you see the salvation of Yahweh. In closing, I would like to close with a prayer that is found in the book of Hakaba, if I'm pronouncing that right, H-A-B. Let us turn to the book of Hakaba. The first three letters is H-A-B. It is found, excuse me one minute, Zephaniah. Right before the book of Zephaniah, Habakkuk, however you pronounce that, is between the book of Nehem and Zephaniah. And I would like to read his prayer that is found in the third chapter. And it reads, A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon Shahagna. O Yahweh, I have heard thy speech, and I hope we can say that today, and was afraid. O Yahweh, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years. Make known, and wrath, remember mercy. Elohim came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise, and his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hands. 
and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the peasant, and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of cushion and affliction and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was Yahweh displeased against the rivers? Was thy anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea? That thy did ride upon thy horses and thy chariot of salvation? Thy bow was made quite naked, according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Selah. Thy did cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the waters passed by. The deep uttered his voice, and up and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thy arrows they went, and at the shining of the glistering spear. Thy did march through the land in indignation. Thy did thrust the heathen in anger. Thy went is forth for the thy went is forth for the salvation of thy people, even for even for salvation with thy anointing. Thy wound is thy wound is the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation into the neck. Selah. Thy deer strike through with the, his sheaves the head of his villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Thy deer walk through the sea with thy horses, though the heap of great waters, or through the heap of great waters. When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered, at the voice, rightness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up into the people, he will invade them, with his troops. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vine, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in Yahweh, even though we find ourselves in hell. Yet I will rejoice in Yahweh. I will joy in the Elohim of my salvation. Yahweh, Elohim, is my strength, and he alone will make my feet like hind feet, and he will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singer on my string instrument. So that was a, a prayer of this great prophet, and he understood, even though he found himself in a despicable situation, still he never swayed from understanding that Yahweh is his help, his joy, and his salvation. Now we will close with the last chapter, and the last chapter that I would love to close with is found in the book of Psalms. Let's go to Psalms 136 in closing this great presentation, which was called See the Salvation of Yahweh, Psalms 136. And this great salvation, as we have seen with our own eyes, only come by way 
of Yahweh's holy name's sake and his great mercies, which endures forever. Psalms 136 in closing. And it reads in Psalms 136, picking up at the very first verse. Oh, give thanks unto Yahweh, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks unto Yahweh of deities, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the master of masters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, and one of the greatest wonders that he have done alone is save us. For his mercy endures forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. To him that smoked the Egyptians, remember, and in, in their firstborn, for his mercy endures forever, and brought out Israel from among them, even though his, even though one of his sons established the salvation, but it still denotes for his mercy endures forever. With a strong hand and with a stretched out arm, for his mercy endures forever. To him which divide the Red Sea into parts, for his mercy endures forever, and made Israel to pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his hosts in the Red Sea, for his mercy endures forever. To him which lead his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endures forever. To him which smoke great kings, for his mercy endures forever. And slew famous kings, for his mercy endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endures forever. And Ar, the king of Bashan, for his mercy endures forever. And gave their land for an inheritance, for his mercy endures forever. Even inheritance into Israel, his servant, for his mercy endures forever. Who remembered us, please take note, in our lowest state, in hell, for his mercy endures forever. And have redeemed us from our enemies, for his mercy endures forever. Who give food to all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks, Israel, and to Yahweh of the heaven, for his mercy alone endures forever. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That will be the end of the presentation, which was called See the Salvation of Yahweh. We will open up for comments and questions, two minutes per comment or question. Hallelujah and shalom, Israel.
Praise Yah. Yeah. Wonderful teaching as always. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is there any comments or questions? I really feel like encouragement in these trying times. I, I didn't really catch it. Speak up a little louder for me. Well, I said it really gives us encouragement in these trying times. Absolutely. For, to let us know not to give up because Yah hasn't forgotten about us. Absolutely. It also should let us know that's all we got. Yep. Without his mercy, we, we ain't got nothing. We're going mm-hmm. to be on here talking about somebody just passed away or somebody diseased or whatever. That's all we can talk about because we don't have the strength. Mm-hmm. We need his mercy. We need his mercy to carry on until the day he do save us. Yep. That's true. And I was trying, I was trying my best to make a distinction between what many of our brothers and sisters have been taught, that they're going to be saved by somebody that's dead. Or are they going to be saved by themselves, where they can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and be saved? Well, now one of those doctrines are true. Mm-mm. And many of us believe these things. Many of us was taught these things. Many of us found ourselves on our knees praying to someone that is dead. That's if the rumor is true. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't even know if the character existed, but even if he did or not, we were never to pray to anyone to save us. We were oh. never to have the hope in anyone other than the creator that made the heaven and earth. Mm-hmm. And if we were uh, able to peek the covenant of the law in captivity, what what is the punishment? Right. What would be the reason for us, to, for our ancestors, to be scattered throughout the four corners if we can do it anywhere? Absolutely. I got one even better. If we are under the covenant of the law and keeping and doing them, why ain't we? Rewarded. Why ain't we delivered? We just seen the incident with Jehoshaphat. They feared Yahweh. They hoped it in Yahweh. And Yahweh came in and kicked in the door and killed everybody. And they was rewarded with a great reward that it took four days to take back home. That's because they were in the land under the covenant, and this great multitude was coming up against them, so they feared, they hoped in Yahweh, they prayed to Yahweh, and Yahweh told them, stand still. This ain't your fight, this my fight. You ain't even going to fight. All those Moabite people, they got killed, and they wind up killing themselves. We got another story like that in the book of Yahshua where we walked around their walls and, 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 and blew trumpets and all that. Next thing you know, the Almighty got them killing themselves. We didn't have to lift a finger. Mm-hmm. But today, we say we trust in Yahweh, but we're doing all the fighting. We hear people talking about, well, you better get ready. You better be prepared for the wilderness. You Man, we're not get off. If we're going to save ourselves, are Yahweh going to save us? He said we're going to be coming out with women and children and women pregnant, and so I guess they're supposed to be ready too. No. The Almighty would never give his glory to another. When we are saved, not only will we know who saved us, but the world would know. Praise the Lord. Yes, I'll praise 
Mm-hmm. And he's supposed to get the honor, the glory for it. That's why it reads throughout the book of Isaiah, he will never give his glory to another because there is no other. And then isn't it a verse where Yah said that he's doing it for his name's sake, not for us, yes, but ma'am. for his holy name's sake if he's going to save Israel? Yes, ma'am, and I have taught that for many years. And one of the first places that come to my mind is you can find that truth in Ezekiel, the 36th chapter. Right. That's my favorite. Ezekiel, the 36th chapter. Yep, that's my favorite. It tells us in Ezekiel, the 36th chapter, the 21st verse, but I had pity for my holy name's sake. Or it says, I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the heathen wherever they went. Therefore, say unto the house, all of the house of Israel, thus say Yahweh, I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, lying, talking about some white boy named Jesus is my son, which you profaned among the heathen, whether ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen in that day shall know that I am Yahweh, said Yahweh, Elohim, when I shall be sanctified in you, before their eyes. Absolutely, sister. It has always been for his holy name's sake. And that's what I teach and have taught many Israelites when they take me to Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter. I let them know that you are misreading that law. And what took credence over that law is what you just stated, for my holy name's sake. You can find that throughout your entire scriptures. Way more than what you think Duma Romney 30 means. But then some people say, too, well, if we're, like, what are we supposed to do while we're in captivity? Do nothing? Fear and Yahweh say, and depart from evil. That, fear right. Yahweh, fear Yahweh and depart from evil. Guess what that makes you? Guess what fear Yahweh and right. depart from evil make you. Do anybody have that, that answer? Right. Based right. on, right. Hold, hold on, hold on. Based on Jeremiah 29. Fear Yahweh and depart from evil based on Jeremiah 29 and based on Jeremiah 24. What will it make you? Righteous. Is it righteous? A righteous citizen. Mm-hmm. You are you are, you going to be more righteous than any citizen in that country. And don't forget, you in another man country. But the mm-hmm. Almighty said, fear me, depart from evil, be the good things, and you will be a great citizen. Mm-hmm. No, that's a cop out. See, that's a cop-out when they say that. That's what they want to say. They want to say, oh, so what we do, just sit here and do nothing? We just be evil? Now, why would you ask me that when I've been telling you for 20 years to fear Yahweh and depart from evil? We can't be saying be evil and depart from it at the same time. Right. And we teach any evil, even evil that ain't mentioned in the scripture. We still teach to depart from it. So we talking about any evil. And they only saying that because they believing in their own uh, righteousness, which is wrong with them. Mm-hmm. Which is no righteousness. Because nope. the Almighty told Israel what his righteousness was, and his righteousness, as far as the law, is when you do every word, when you confirm every word according to the covenant, that was the Israelites' righteousness. Where well, today, we ain't under the covenant. 
So we don't get the righteousness of confirming every word and doing it. So today, all we are left with, which is a great reward, if you understand what you are left with, is to fear Yahweh and depart from evil and wait on your Savior, and he will save you out of this. What else can we do? Only him, not Only the him. other person they talking about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and a lot of people say itself. A lot of people think, well, that ain't that's that ain't really nothing, brother. You telling us that we got to wait on Yahweh. Well, we also telling you to fear Yahweh and to depart from evil and say, well, why is you telling us that? That way you will be a recipient of his mercy while you wait. Because many of us is going to go through so much affliction, so much sadness, so much all the ills that the Almighty speak about that will fall his people. But if we fear Yahweh and we depart from evil, it is Yahweh. He said he will render to every man according to his doings, if it is good or evil. So we're going to trust in that. And many of us can witness the mercies that he has shown us. Every day we wake you. Many of us can witness the mercies that he has shown us in our relationships with our children and everything. But a lot of times we forget. When we find ourselves in distress, we forget that. But wisdom tells us not to forget it. Just like it tells us, don't forget when you're doing good. Because it might be a day that you're going to do bad. It might be a day when hardship come upon you. So you are to remember these days. Is there any um, other comments or questions? Shalom. Yes, Brother Israel. This is Milwaukee out of uh, St. Louis. Yeah. Yeah, shalom. That, uh, shalom. That uh, uh, scripture, Isaiah 60, 19, and 20, about the sun shining no more, is that like a metaphor, or what is that about? You said Isaiah 60? 60, 19, and 20, about the sun uh, shall no more shine, or shall no more be thy light. Yes, it's, it's, it's like a metaphor, and it's a similarity of how that day would be. It just denotes the, the great power and the, and, the, and the light of our creator, uh, where it speaks like he will be our light. You know, it would be so, so much light. It, it, it put me in the mind of, it put me in the mind when Moses went up the mount for 40 days and 40 nights. Y'all remember that story? He came back looking like a light bulb or something. They had to put a veil over him. He was shining so much. Mm-hmm. That's what it put me in the mind. Oh, just okay. being in the presence of Yahweh, just being a, in the midst of all that great light. Moses mm-hmm. came out, came back down the, the mount like an alien. He was glowing up. Mm-hmm. They had to put a veil over him. He was so bright. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what it put me in the mind of. So that okay. type of metaphor. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, told her. Ooh, yeah. has yeah. to be nice. Yeah, I would love to see that too. And just like the people yeah. seen most, I know they was, I know they was amazed. Like, what <laughs> the heck happened to most? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Is there any other comments or questions? Great comments, great questions, brother. If there isn't any other comments or questions, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I just thought it would be a great idea, and that was the spirit that came upon me to teach on Yahweh's salvation and mercy. Because I I see a lot of times when I'm talking to my brothers and sisters, when I'm looking at the different comments that are made on social media, I don't see the acknowledgement 
that the people is truly waiting to be saved. I don't see that. I see a lot of pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. I see a lot of let's get prepared for this, that, and another. When why are you doing all that when you're supposed to be being saved? Mm-hmm. And he says it in, in his book over and over again, be still, he says. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. Be still. Mm-hmm. He tells us about the special effects and blessings that will befall them that wait on him. Yes. Mm. Yes. And the wicked man will tell you waiting is not good enough. But it's better to wait on Yahweh than to do these things that our forefathers did. That's why we're messed up now. Right. Absolutely. But some people think if we don't attempt to keep the Sabbath day and the new moon and all the feast days in captivity that we're sending, and I, me personally, I don't, I don't understand why they're not getting it. I mean, just the condition we're in, just the things that's going on in this country, how can you even fix your mind to think that you can do something so holy, so righteous. I mean, it's, yes. it's just like, it's just yeah. crazy to me that yeah. how can, like, I feel that it's a uh, blatant disrespect to the creator to, to even attempt to do these things here when all the, yeah. per, with all the perversion and it's getting worse every single day. So yeah. I think, when you're trying to do these things and you're attempting to say that you're memorializing and stuff, I feel that it's sin. And I I feel the same way, sister. And reason why people say that what they say is because they don't trust in Yahweh. And I was, I was pondering on something that happened with one of our Kings called Uriah. And I was trying to figure out how can I throw this story in this in, in, in this teaching. So I didn't use it. But mm-hmm. since you brought up what you just said, it gave me an opportunity <laughs> to throw this story. Mm-hmm. Let me show you let me show yeah. y'all something. Say and that. I'm going to yeah. this story is gonna agree with, with the comment that you just made. Watch this. Mm-hmm. We're dealing with let me find it right quick. We're dealing with the king called Uriah. Let me show you what Uriah did, and let's see, can we make a distinction? Let's see, can we actually see with this man doing something that Yahweh have not told him to do, would that be sin? So today, we find ourselves in captivity. We trying to emulate what our fathers did that was under the covenant of the law. Well, we about to show even being under the covenant of the law, you can only do what Yahweh commands you to do. If you do anything other than that, that is sin. And that's what we're doing today. The only thing different is we're not in the land. But we saying we under the covenant of the law and we saying we're supposed to do all these things and we will be accepted by Yahweh. Well let me show you something. Let me find I don't right see now. how we can. I don't see how we can do it when I we can't do all. Either. When we can't do all, right? We can't do all. So you can't. It's all or nothing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I had one that um, Taylor did. He didn't know what a burn offering is. How are you keeping the heaven mm-hmm. holy, and you don't even know what a burn offering? Asking me, someone that's been to this <laughs> seven months, and you've been plus years. Mm-hmm. Asking me what a burn offering is when I told him we can't, you know, do these things in this land because this is not our land. Right. And I told him about the burn offering, the altar, which only spoke, all this stuff only spoke and did a certain time, certain day by certain people. And they're mm-hmm. not here because we don't know who we are. And, and this was, you told this to a teacher? Yes, sir. The one I told you told me that I'm getting confused, dabbling. Between camps, this uh, sister Taisha, I, uh, Cephas' cousin. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, oh. and he won't he won't call in, and he laughed at me today when I said I was on the conference call 
and I don't have time um for that. So right. he's blocked. Well, a lot of yeah, them I have blocked. the spirit uh, of hold uh, 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 oh, no, on, y'all. So the brother okay. called. So the brother called you today. Yes, sir. Because I don't watch IUIC anymore, and I told him I was on the conference call, and he made some type of emoji, pretty much being childish and supposed to be, you know, someone that's so-called anointed or whatever right. they call themselves. And he, you know, he be asking me why do why am I reading palm, um, Psalms and Proverbs, you know. It's because it's wisdom and knowledge that you need to learn and learn to be still. And there's something they don't know how to do. Oh, they don't read? He didn't even know. Um, I guess not. I guess they just read. You know how they are, just like the Christians in the church. They only read certain um, chapters, and they only read certain verses. I read the whole verse because I never really read the Bible, and I'm not ashamed to say that. I'm glad I found my way. I'll praise it. Thank you. Most high for that. Yeah, well, that's that's exactly why he didn't know nothing about the burnt offering. Exactly, he, he ain't even reading. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But he been when I told him my cousin, um, Cephas, um, been you know thirty plus years, and he want to downplay him as well. And I told him, well, call brother Samuel. Anyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he won't call. But he wants to you know argue with me about stuff. He know I'm. Still a lost sheep. I'm finding my way, but I have learned to be still that quickly. You see what I'm saying? Because he he says it over and over again <laughs> to be still and wait and depart from evil. Yeah, people oh, yeah. can rather. That's, that's, like, it sounds like it sound like you keeping him in check. The scriptures. I say, am. They said, the scripture says, even a fool is wise when he keep his mouth shut. And he keep yep. on opening, he keep on opening up his mouth. And he ain't, yep. he, he's not showing no wisdom. Even though he nope. can't correct you, even though he can't correct you, he's going to he keep calling you, he's going to keep trying to solicit you, but he don't have yeah. answers. He's a fool. He he he's he a fool. You he said the key word, a fool. He got to accept the correction. Yes, and I pray for him, you know, because he's lost. He's so lost. So it's ridiculous. And I'm, like I said, I'm a newbie, and I can see through him. And, you know, I talked to my cousin, and he told me, no, don't do that. And I'm glad I, you know, there wasn't nothing but Yahweh made me reach out to my cousin. Well, a lot of them are full I of was, pride. Well, they full they of pride. Are. They are. Okay, and that's why they can't they can't they can't receive correction. They think they know everything. Yes. And no, I would say yes. that's I would say that's the evil spirit. And I always pray to you, please don't put no evil spirit no. in me because I, I ain't never gonna think I know everything. Exactly. Too, After today when he laughed when I said I was, you know, learning the law correctly, every word, I knew then that he was an evil spirit. And mm-hmm. um I know that I'm on the right path. I've been praying to Yahweh to show me that I'm on the right path. And I know I'm on the right path. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel right doing those Sabbaths. You know, I was sinning 40 some years. I'm 41. And all of a sudden, I, I'm holy because you say so, because I do these Sabbaths and we're not doing them correctly. Right. Y'all you not even sure. teaching us how to do them correctly. Mm-hmm. You know, so I didn't feel right in my spirit when I was trying to do those things. Yeah. And I don't feel I that was, way anymore. I was grieved every time I went to this class. Every time I walked through the door, before, like the night before, I would be praying so hard, yes. fasting, crying yes. to God. You're scared. you scared. Please help me yes. not to, you know, please help me not to uh, pollute your Sabbath. Please, please, please. And then I would go yes. right in there, and then things would be going on that's not right. And then you right. find yourself not keeping it, and you know it. You know you're not, and right. then it just grieves you, and then you feel so defeated every every time. Yes, every time. I, I knew I wasn't because I didn't even get to go to to the classes. I was doing mm-hmm. it at home, and 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 you know our house is not holy enough to have these Sabbaths, and so I well, just didn't feel no right place. in my spirit. Yeah, no place here is holy enough. We don't have and it's we not. don't have any land. We don't have any land in this place that could be holy enough for Yah's presence to be here. 
I mean, there's no right. place. There's no building. No there's home. nothing. Ain't no holy right. in here. Mm-mm. And we and See, we that, know that was before I learned. You know. Mm-hmm. And we know we know that there's no place here in our captivity, being in America and scattered abroad, because all we got to do is remember what was said in Psalms uh, 95. It talked about the people that wasn't able to enter into the land of rest. So there was a particular land. The last verse of Psalms 95, which is the 11th verse, it says, and to whom I swear in my wrath and my anger that they should not enter into my rest. It's talking about a land. Mm-hmm. The people didn't, the, it, it, it ain't talking about the people not keeping the Sabbath in the wilderness. It's talking mm-hmm. about the right. people not being able to enter into the land of rest. Right. That's where all the Sabbaths was commanded to be done, just like all the laws was commanded to be done. We got many scriptures, and, and our brothers and them hate for me to bring those scriptures out, where it says that we are to keep all that Yahweh commanded in the land that you possess. Well, they say you can do it where you do well. Well, that is going. Well, if they say that, that mm-hmm. is a controversy. Between, that's a quarrel. Like it mm-hmm. reads in, like it reads in Leviticus twenty-six. That is a quarrel against His covenant with your Creator. That means you fussing with your Creator. Right? Yep. Yep. That's dangerous. Yep. That, is, that is more than dangerous. <laughs> but it yes, is deadly because it's, it's death. Death is, mm-hmm. is what you, your reward would be. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people have, I mean, I mean, people that, that we thought was great, they will not acknowledge that. How are you going to teach? How are you going to teach that you're a Moray? How are you going to teach that you're a priest and you won't even acknowledge what Yahweh said? It tells us in the law, for those that teach stay under the law, cursed be he that yeah. confirm not all the words of the law and do them. And all the people shall say amen. So that lets us know when mm-hmm. one man say something other than the law, we're supposed to all be against him. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right. You can stone him if you want to. You go uh, to jail. I said you can try to stone him if you want to in a, another man's land. You <laughs> go to jail. Uh, you ain't, you ain't going to do that. They're a bunch of cowards when it comes to that. that. That's one of my favorite ones. I bring up the Sabbath every time. They're cowards. You keep on talking about you holy and set apart and consecrated. I bet you ain't going to kill him that's defiled the Sabbath. I bet you that. And they're not. They're not. And they're not. Because they're defiling it themselves. And every time I say that, and every time I say that, I let them know I'm I'm being sarcastic. I don't want you to go out there and try it because you're going to wind up in jail <laughs> or they're going to kill you. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> but let me let me show this uh, this testimony and let's see can we discern the holy from the unholy, the right from the wrong. In Second Chronicles, there is a story about King Uriah when he ruled Yehuda. And this man, the Almighty made him great, but I'm, I'm using this story to show you. If you go against any of the words of Yahweh, I don't care how great you is, he will make you to nothing. So that means if the Almighty said, keep the Sabbath in my land. And you say, well, we can keep the Sabbath wherever we at. The Almighty will make you like this king you're right. Let's read. In Second Chronicles, the 26th verse, I mean the 26th chapter, I'm going to skip over and go straight to the point. It tells us, let's pick up at the 14th verse. We're reading from Second Chronicles, the 26th chapter about King Uriah, Josiah. In the 14th verse, it says this. And Uriah prepared for them throughout all the host shields 
and spears. Please read the whole chapter because it's talking about how great Yahweh made this man. This man is made great. It says, and spears and helmets and harbor guns and bows and slings to cast stone. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by Connie men to be on the towers and upon the bullwhips to shoot arrows and great stones with her. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped. Note, he was marvelously helped. And that's like a lot of us. A lot of us don't be knowing nothing. And then the Almighty put the spirit on you and, and allow you to start learning this book. And then we, we forsake, we forsake this mercy. We forsake our wisdom and our knowledge and we become dumb. Thus it reads. For he was marvelously helped till he was strong. This strong denotes strong-headed. This strong denotes rebellious. This strong denotes uh, where the Almighty done lift you up. Now all of a sudden you think you the creator. It reads in the 16th verse. But when he was strong, please take note that I am not adding anything. His heart was lifted up to his destruction. And then when we start teaching people that we can keep the Sabbath wherever we at and we putting Yahweh name on it and our little title and all that, well, we have lifted up ourselves. And we are only lifting up ourselves to destruction to teach that we're supposed to be paying tithes, to teach that we are under the Sabbath in the enemy's land. Thus it reads, for he transgressed against Yahweh, his Elohim, how it says, and went into the temple of Yahweh to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Now let me stop and expound a little bit because this is a man that Yahweh has put a spirit on to make him great. But the man took that spirit Beyond what Yahweh said to where he transgressed. See, because if he got all this knowledge, he supposed to know you can't go in the temple. You ain't no priest. So let's read and see what happened. He went in the temple and burnt incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah, the priest, went in after him. And with him, look how many priests is with him. Four score priests. It is 81 men going after this guy. And this is a guy that Yahweh made marvelously. Yahweh helped in him marvelously. But he forsook. He let his knowledge or his wisdom forsake him to where he felt like he was holier than I. Well, I can do this. Yeah, I know the law said you got to be in your land. I know the law said that the priest is the only one that can make the burnt offering. I know this. I know that. But I'm going to teach y'all that we can do it today. Well, look what happened. It says, and with, and with him, four score priests of Yahweh that were villain men, and they withstood your right. The king and said unto him, It pertains not unto thee, Uriah, to burn incense unto Yahweh, but to the priests, the son of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thy honor from Yahweh. Then Uriah was wroth because he wholly denied. He said, no, nah, we can do this even though 81 men is talking against you. 
81 men is saying, well, no, only the priest can do this. No, you can only keep the Sabbath in the land. Well, he was robbed, and he kept teaching what he was doing. Look what happened. It says, and Uriah was robbed and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was robbed with the priest, look what happened. The leprosy even rose upon his forehead before the priest in the house of Yahweh from beside the incense altar. And Uriah, excuse me, as Isaiah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was a leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from this. Yea, himself haste also to go out, because Yahweh has smitten him. And Uriah the king was a leopard, and to the day of his death, this great man that had all this wisdom that Yahweh gave him, wanted to be holy denied, forsook Yahweh, and Yahweh took all that wisdom away from him and made this man a leper. And it says he was a leper, and to the day of his death, and dwelt in a several house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of Yahweh, and Yotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. So while I'm using this story to show, in, re in resemblance to what our brothers and sisters do, I don't care how much knowledge you got, you still got to confirm every word. And if you don't confirm every word, and you do something other than what is confirmed, you might become a leper just like him. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. should not be teaching people to keep the Sabbath here in America when you know your Bible tells us where all the laws was to be done. And that was in the land that you possess. You do not possess America, nor any other place being scattered abroad. So I just thought that was a good story to show even if somebody did have the spirit on them, that don't mean you can't forsake Yahweh, and that don't mean that you are to teach them any other thing than what Yahweh did. That's right. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Oh. I know we, we get restless. We got children and everything. That's why we, that's why we had these conference calls. We ain't in no class. We ain't in no class playing no role. We for real with this. Is there any other comments or questions before I let you go? Oh, that was a good class once again. <laughs> Out of ya. Yeah. I thank each and every one of you for lending the ear that you may hear, that you thank may you perceive too. these words and fear Yahweh and depart from me there. If there mm -hmm. isn't any other comments, we'll go ahead and end the, com end the presentation, which was called See the Salvation of Yahweh, with Psalm um, 68. I want 68 or 66. One second. Oh. Let's end it with Psalm 62. Let us all please turn our Holy Scriptures to Psalm 62. And we we'll end it on, no, 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 we won't, because Brother Yamin read Psalm 62. Let's read Psalm 68, like I said at first. Psalm 68 and close. And we will read Psalm 68, verse 1, to verse 19, and close. Psalm 68, verse 1, 
to 19. And it reads. Let Yahweh arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. And you must hate him if you don't confirm what he says. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melt before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of Yahweh. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before Yahweh, and let them exceedingly rejoice. Sing unto Yahweh. Sing praises to his name. Exalt him that rise upon the heavens by his name, Yahweh, and rejoice before him, a father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows, is Yahweh in his holy habitation. Yahweh set us to solitary and families. He bring out those which are bound with chains, and they all denote salvation. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Yahweh, when thy wentest forth before thy people, when thy did march through the wilderness, sea line, the earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of Yahweh. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel. Thy Yahweh did send a plentiful rain, whereby thy did confirm thy inheritance when it was weary. Thy congregation have dwelt therein. Thy, Yahweh, has prepared of thy goodness for the poor. Yahweh gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. Kings of armies did flee apace, and she that tarried at home divided the spoil. Though we have lain among the pots, yet shall ye be as the wings of a dove covered with silver, and her feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as snow and solemn. The hill of Yahweh is as the hill of Bashan, and high hill as the hill of Bashan. Why leap ye, ye high hills? This is the hill which Yahweh desired. To dwell in. Yea, Yahweh will dwell in it forever. The chariots of Yahweh are 20,000, even thousands of angels. Yahweh is among them, as in Sinai in the holy place. Thy, this will be the last verse I will read. I'll, I'll go to the 20th verse. It says, Thy has ascent on high. Thy has led captivity captives. Thy has received gifts for men. Yea, for the rebellious also, that Yahweh Elohim might dwell among them. Blessed be Yahweh, who daily loads us with benefits, even Yahweh of our salvation. Selah. He that is our Elohim, is the Elohim of salvation, and, and to Yahweh belongs the issues from death. Hallelujah, 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 and shalom, Israel. Hallelujah. Shalom, family. Hallelujah. Shalom, family.